Hey guys, Gaia Gaius here. Well, another video, another series reaching its end. This time, we are concluding our journey with Gundam Sentinel with Part 4. I know I had originally planned for this series to be five parts, however, truth be told, Sentinel has been a very difficult story for me to cover, at least from a creative perspective. With me wanting to move on to other obscure and more interesting Gundam stories in the UC, I wanted to get back into discovering more things that pique my interest. So, without further ado, let's go into a recap of the story so far. That way, we can get this finale underway. Gundam Sentinel, a side story written by Masaya Takahashi, tells the story of two groups fighting in the aftermath of the Grips War, featured in Zeta Gundam, and tells the story of how the Federation was forced to fight a war on two fronts as the first Neo Zeon War begins, with followers of the now-defeated Titans declaring themselves the new decides, the Federation has assembled Task Force Alpha to eliminate them. However, the mission to quell their uprising has become a major challenge. The new decides have revealed themselves to be a much more cunning and complicated threat. This group of Titans followers, loyal to the Titans' mission, have their own unique views and plans. Seeing that the Federation has become a puppet for the AU to manipulate, this group of space-based Earthnoids have allied themselves with the people of Air City in order to secure an alliance for a future plan to create a Lunar City Coalition, a lunar-based civilization, one free from Earth, yet still loyal to it in many ways. However, this desire to see the moon grow on its own two feet has been met with skepticism and criticism. The Federation seeing the new decides alliance with the moon as an attempt to secede from the Earth, and with that, have now brought the full force of the EFF onto Ayers' doorstep. All the while, within the ranks of Task Force Alpha, a young mobile suit pilot has been tasked with piloting the experimental and highly sophisticated XS Gundam, a machine with ties to the pilot's own past and with a mysterious AI system that sleeps within the machine until now. With Task Force Alpha suffering major losses from an attack from the new decide's own Gundam, the Titanic Mark V, they press on towards the gates of Ayers, and with the new decide's and their allies not willing to back down, Task Force Alpha must act swiftly in order to prevent these Separatists from escaping once again. With Neo Zeon lurking in the shadows as the conflict continues, Task Force Alpha must act quickly to defeat these foes before this conflict goes nuclear. Now, let us conclude this series on Gundam Sentinel and the story of Task Force Alpha and the New Decides with Part 4. All images and characters are owned by the respective companies and creators. Chapter 9. The final push towards Air City is already underway. It has been three days since the previous battle, and the new decides have lost tremendous amounts of ground. Their forces only now hold a mere four square kilometers from the central government headquarters. The forces of Task Force Alpha just on the edge of the central dome with the Federation at its back. With the Federation's main fleet arriving to aid them, Commander Brian Ayano and his traitor fleet have been utterly crippled, pushed off the face of the moon, and sent retreating all the way back to Psi-5 in shambles. The Air City Defense Forces have been utterly destroyed in their entirety, with the new decides forces who had tried to command them now being the only ones left to hold the line, their mobile suits and last remaining soldiers now being the only ones left to guard the HQ Center. The city itself has now become fully occupied by Federation extermination forces, bent on completely wiping out any remaining signs of resistance from the local inhabitants. Pinefield speaks to the troops gathered around him in the building. I am grateful to you all. You have fought bravely. However, now it is my turn and Air Cities to walk into the annals of history. It is our destiny. However, all of you must go on. Continue fighting. This is not simply a political battle, for it is a battle for the heart and soul of the Earth. The current government has no ability to represent the thoughts and feelings of the majority. It is not the government, but us, the people, who should make the decisions. He is grateful to them all. He is honored to have fought with them. The remaining new decides, all surrounding him as he gives this final speech, their numbers being less than half of what they started with. The remaining soldiers, all boarding the old city's mass driver network. Their remaining mobile suits, being sent far away with their remaining officers. With no more usable ships, they must now escape on board shuttles. The Federation, sending its main forces to secure the city, seem to have ignored the old mass driver systems located underground. Their main objective seems to be the headquarters after all. This conflict is, in the Federation's eyes, a battle instigated by Pinefield and the new decides 
alone. There were many thoughts of using the mass driver system to bombard the Earth and the colonies, but doing so would only turn the world against the City of Airs. This way, the way they're using the mass driver network now, is simply a means of escape for them. Deep inside the underground facilities, the Gundam Mark V is having trouble. The mechanics apologize. The suit is far too complex for the new decides remaining technicians to properly maintain it. The incoms have only a small amount of uses left in them. However, they were able to install replacements for the unit's lost missile launchers. And the unit's IMPC has been calibrated to allow the weapons to be used in conjunction with it. Brave Cod, even though he is not entirely satisfied with repairs, thanks them. The leader of the new decides boarding the gigantic Gundam and heading out, his engineers wishing him luck as the door closes behind him. Everyone in the command center salutes the Mark V as it marches down the corridor. Brave Cod approaching the other mobile suits awaiting his command of the cargo gates to the government facility, giving the men their orders. Tosh Cray, your team will go and secure the spaceport so that their men can escape on board the shuttlecrafts. As for Cod himself, his team will go secure the main cargo mass driver. He tells them that even if any of them fall in battle, they must keep going. He reminds them that one man's sacrifice could in reality save the lives of ten other men, and he reminds them not to forget that. This is Cod's final order to his men, his words granting them the eagerness to carry on. Stealthily, Four teams work together to secure their targets, Cod's team and Josh's team gaining control of the mass driver rails on the surface, while Tosh Cray and his men secure the spaceport to the north of the city. While the remaining troops navigate the labyrinthine corridors of Air City's underground cargo transport systems, readying their mobile suits for battle, Brave Cod's team is now comprised of a bunch of ramshackle units, the Zeku Ainz units, the massive Zeku Zwei, a couple Jim 3s, as well as a contingent of modified one-year war era Zakus that were supplied through the Air City Militia. The last troops stationed at the government headquarters pulling a last stand as they divert the Federation's attention away from the Decides mission. As this diversion is underway, we turn to Ryu, who has finally managed to get a moment of rest from the constant fighting. He and his two Zeta Plus wingmen have been flying patrols non-stop to combat zones all over the city. Sigmund, the pilot from the previous battle who'd been shot down, had managed to return with his unit after four days of repairs. Seeing as Josh Offshore's sharpshooting skills did a number on his unit, they all turned to hear Manning's over the intercom. There's been a development from the government headquarters. He needs them to get out there now. Prepare to engage, with Ryu himself dumping his coffee as he starts his machine up. He's tired, exhausted. He hasn't rested in days, and as he's receiving these orders, he could feel as if his whole body has aged ten years. Everything just aches. He curses under his breath. You old bastard. Is he getting a kick out of seeing us suffer? The young man is angry that Mannings is having the Gundams be the ones to take the brunt of every attack. Regardless, Ryu launches in his Gundam. Tex and Sigmund head out as well, launching in their Zeta Pluses. Over with Brave and Josh, the Gundam Mark V is leading the charge to seize the mass driver, their forces charging through as they punch through the Federation's defensive lines, with Brave ordering Josh to take his men and provide a diversion. Brave cutting a Jim 3 to pieces as he orders his men to follow him and spread out as they get closer to the target. As the two sides exchange fire, one of Josh's men gets a little too cocky, his young rookies letting their intense training get to their heads, all of them wanting to prove themselves as warriors. Josh the though is infuriated by this. He ordered them to stay behind and defend the government headquarters, instead they're all out here helping him. The young men are all too eager. They say they won't get in the way, but Josh's warnings go unheeded. One of the young cadets is instantaneously vaporized by the excess as Ryu and his wingmen arrive on the scene. He warns Brave, it's the three Gundams coming in from above, with Josh watching as the Mark V in mid-flight decimates the remainder of the Jim 3s defending the mass driver, with Josh and the cadets firing into the air as the three Gundams fly by, not a single shot from the young pilots managing to hit. As they try to maintain a shot on them, Josh orders them again, leave now, but still nothing. Another cadet has his suit destroyed. This leaves Josh in rage. Come on, you cowards! Come and fight me! You have no right to kill them! As the man rages, Brave manages to steer him. Josh, take care of the gray ones to the rear. 
I'll take the white one. As he tells him who to go after, Braid activates the Mark V's incoms, the deployable beam cannons launching from the unit's back and firing into Ryu's formation, the beams sending the trio into a scatter. As Ryu descends, he can see the Mark V as it approaches, the young man being surprised that the all-blue Gundam is actually going in for a direct attack. All right? Then let's declare a winner right here! The Mark V charges in, its incoms ready to fire again, but Ryu doesn't care. He came at the perfect time. He's prepared for this. The excess then reveals a new piece of equipment it's been hiding for a while. Its knees opening up and launching wire-guided incoms of its own. However, unlike the ones seen on the Mark V, these incoms are beam reflector types. As Brave attempts to fire, the reflectors redirect his own attacks, leaving Ryu the opportunity to unleash a burst of fire from the excess's waste cannons. As the beams fly off the reflectors, Brave is caught off guard as he witnesses his attacks are being rebounded off the incoms into a flurry of bizarre angles and a slicing series of odd deflections. Brave just able to jerk the suit out of the way to avoid them, only for the third shot to fall short and melt the Mark V's left leg thruster. Brave is impressed. Only a trick like that works against amateurs. He releases his own incomes again, the cables swerving around the excess like snakes. A beam goes right for the excess's torso, Ryu managing just to dodge it. However, as the second shot comes in, Ryu isn't able to. But the beam doesn't hit. In a moment of instinctual protection, the excess's AI, Alice, draws the Gundam's beam rifle and uses it to physically block the shot. The Mark V's incom melting the weapon to scrap. Ryu is stunned. You're trying to protect me. He's stunned, in awe of this Gundam. It just saved his life. But time is of the essence. He checks the rifle. It's fried. The reflector incoms uses are becoming limited as well. He ditches his gun, recalls his incoms, and as he does, fires out the excess's reserve incom, a small one located at the top of his head. Ryu evades beam after beam from the Mark V, the Gundam just narrowly avoiding getting hit by the constant stream of energy attacks, his reflectors working hard to shield the Gundam from as many of them as possible. Over with Brave, the man is dumbfounded. Why the hell hasn't this guy given up yet? That mobile suit is useless against the Mark V! With the excess Gundam avoiding the majority of his shots, and the Mark V's ability to keep the incoms from wearing out diminishing, Brave swaps to his beam rifle, the excess managing to land a light hit on the Mark V's back with the unit's reserve incom. The two Gundams zip all over the battlefield. Not a single outside mobile suit is able to keep up with their speed. Come on! Come on! Ryu is forced to recall his incoms for charging, Brave sees a chance and unleashes a burst of his suit's micro-missile pods to burst munitions onto the Gundam, all of the unit's incoms being damaged in the ensuing blast of steel pellets, leaving Ryu to curse as he watches the special munitions tear his incoms to shreds. Immediately, Ryu swaps to the S Gundam's waste cannons, trying to gain distance between him and the Mark V. Damn it, this guy won't quit! Brave sneers as the Gundam switches to another series of weapons. The man can tell that the Gundam's pilot is obviously compensating for his lack of skill with the sheer amount of weapons his mobile suit has. Avoiding another burst from the Mark V's scatter munitions, the S Gundam turns and fires again, only to see that the Mark V has vanished and the steel pellets landing a hit on the Gundam's body. He looks over and can see the Mark V standing on the ground, the two Gundams managing to stare at each other in the face as Brave leaps up into the air, charging the Gundam, the Mark V managing to grapple hold of the excess's waste cannons while simultaneously landing a solid kick to the Gundam's chest. Do you really think these are enough to win against me? Ryu's seat shakes as the unit's cockpit slightly breaches to the vacuum. Damn it! This old bastard, he's going overboard! Brave snarls. All you new types are still green. Keep crying, punk! Watch as I squash you! But Ryu shouts out, I'm no new type! I thought your Gundam was something special. Instead, you're nothing. You can't match my skill! As the two argue, Alice hears their words. 
Mother taught me to be human, to become a warring human. Warring humans are all mad creatures, but I have yet to experience madness myself. In order for me to go crazy, I must malfunction, and if that happens, my functions will be stopped. Then, does that mean I am inferior to humans? I do not understand what they're saying. They are so sure to divide themselves into good and evil, which neither can coexist. However, which side is right? No, no. Both of them are mad. Both lack logical reasoning. But there is still another way. Something happens to Alice deep inside her. <sighs> I'm forming two different wills myself. I can't. I can't investigate further. I should not change arguments. I need to separate. I need to separate. Right. Right. I have my own will. I must depend on myself in battle. But does that mean that I have to walk a path of self-degradation to do it? The Gundam snaps, the waste cannons disengaging, the Mark V's hands slipping from the gun barrels. The excess returns a blow, a devastating kick to the chest, the Gundam Mark V smashing into the lunar surface with a crushing blow, the excess stumbling to the ground as well. Brave growls as he can feel his broken tooth begin to bleed from the shockwave. He draws his beam saber, the blade slowly extending, with Ryu himself having <laughs> wet his pants again from the g-forces he's now beginning to feel the pain of. He looks up and can see the Mark V charging in for a swing, but before he can act, Alice draws the excess's sub-beam saber from the unit's knee. What? I didn't do that! His confusion is immediately broken when he sees the Mark V get closer. Die, new type! Ryu panics. He's never really had to fight in close quarters before. No, no, no! I don't want to die! His body seizing up almost entirely. I don't want to die! Alice hears him. She understands him. The natural instinct to survive. Something that only living beings possess. One that she now gets and understands how wondrous it truly is. And with that moment of clarity, Ryu is jolted back into the fight thanks to the Gundam and its constant shaking. He's piloting this Gundam. He is not dying here. And in a matter of sheer seconds, the Mark V swings down, the excess pivoting to the left in a nearly fluid motion, the Mark V recalling its arm upward for another swing, only for Ryu to immediately turn back and impale the Mark V directly in the cockpit with its saber. The Gundam freezes in place, the blade landing perfectly centered in the Gundam's chest. In Brave's final moments, he dreams of the battlefield, his thoughts carrying him towards the Earth. Finally, I can return home. The Mark V sparks from its reactor, green energy leaving Ryu to draw his blade away as his opponent explodes. Did... did I win? Ryu thinks to himself. He cherishes the life he has, deeply. He wonders what kind of person his opponent was. What kind of man was he to think of Ryu as a new type? His thoughts, though, can't help but feel the gratitude that, thankfully, he's alive. However, even though Ryu had managed to win the fight and destroy the Mark V, something else had been happening outside of his periphery. The new decides had taken the mass driver, but little to their knowledge, it wouldn't be for long. A shadow has been cast over Air's city. Something big, something's coming, something soon. Chapter 10. Josh pursues one of the Zeta Pluses only for his concentration to become broken as a massive explosion fills his monitor. He sees the excess fly away as the blast consumes the Mark V Gundam. How? How? No, no, no! This can't be happening! It isn't true! He's frozen. Captain Cod. He watches as the Gundams escape, Josh completely unable to do anything as he's left to grieve the loss of his commander. The message immediately makes it to Tosh, who himself has been left completely stunned by this news. Not brave. Josh himself is frozen. Tosh left to ponder everything. Josh, are you okay? Yes, I can still fight. But Tosh wasn't asking about his ability to fight. Regardless of this, Tosh bites back on his emotions. He knows Josh is strong enough to handle it. It gives him a sickly feeling, but he decides to make use of it. He's reminded of his time during the One Year War, how he'd been forced to use his manipulation tactics while he was trapped in a Xeon POW camp in order to escape. To him, it feels just like those times, 
having to make full use of the youths within his ranks for him to escape. Tosh then places full command of their troops in the hands of Josh Offshore. He says it's too much of a burden, but Tosh says he has to. They've got everything under control now that they're at the spaceport. Besides, he trusts him. He can do this. And with those words, Josh finally assumes command of the battlefield, the first of the shuttles taking off, heading towards their rendezvous point with the remains of Aeno's fleet. As the two cut off each other's comms, Josh mumbles to himself, What am I supposed to do now that you're gone, Brave? What can I possibly do on my own? Brave was a warrior, a soldier, and Tosh, well, Josh always saw him as a dreamer. But now, even though he didn't like it, now is the time for Josh to become a leader. He takes one last look at the shuttles, himself now understanding the weight placed on his shoulders. As the next stage of the battle approaches, we turn to the air's city streets. The fighting has resulted in over half the city being disarmed by the Federation troops, who are now attempting to breach the government headquarters. Pinefield reads a note he's received from one of his men, bloodied and wounded. It's too late. It's all too late. Ha! The Space Noids, the ones we never really got along with, are in the end the only ones who are offering to provide aid. How ironic. The messenger asks him, how should they reply, with Pinefield saying that the last thing they should be doing is asking for their help. However, after a moment to ponder, he finally comes up with something. Nothing hateful, but something. While we are grateful to Neo Zeon for offering to assist us, Air City will unfortunately end its resistance today and will re-enter the control of the Federation government. I shall die taking responsibility. We again thank Neo Zeon for their kind intentions and hope that they will continue to support the warriors of the new decides. He then tells his messenger that there's no need to encrypt the report, just send it directly. The young man protesting. They've been totally and utterly defeated. Let him walk out with him. But the mayor says no. No. Only the elderly possess the right to die. I owe you youngsters far too much, and in order to save the reputation of this city, I must do this on my own. As for all of you, your mission is to educate the soldiers of tomorrow on the meaning of this battle and what it represents. If you are all to die, who will I have left to depend on? The mayor places a hand on the young man's shoulder, leaving the man to bow and leave Pinefield to himself. The man steps out, closing the door, but not before hearing the sliding sound of a drawer open, something metallic in the mayor's hand, only to be followed by the sound of a single gunshot as he leaves the room. The messenger walks down the halls. Wounded and civilians line the halls. A child asks his mother, Is the Gundam coming to kill us? The scared boy holding a toy of the RX-78 in his hands as the building rumbles. His mother unable to say anything, leaving the boy to angrily throw his toy against the wall as they cry. However, the messenger gives it back to him, the man forcing a smile as he does so. No. Gundam is a symbol of justice. It will not kill them. As he heads out, he pats the boy on the head, knowing in his heart that this was now up to him to teach the next generation of heroes. The old generation invited this war, and as the survivors, they had an obligation to bear the burden of it all. However, they would nonetheless learn from this experience, and hopefully start something new. Up in space, the Shadow, which I had mentioned, has finally arrived. A fleet of ships has come to Luna, one that has been sitting on the sidelines this entire time, but now seeing this moment as the perfect time to act. A crimson battleship stands at the center of the formation. Deck 2, are you ready? Launch the C-types immediately! Are we launching the E-types as well? We are preparing for war, of course we are! Countless mobile suits launch into battle. Dozens, maybe even a hundred, all painted a bright pink. An officer stands on the ship's bridge, a recognizable face if you watch the original Gundam series. I can't believe it's really resulted to this. The ship's captain asking him, Is it really wise to do this? Admiral Twining. Should we recall our troops? But Twining says no, just wait. Recalling their own ground troops now would only hurt their morale. Besides, this is the best place to demonstrate their own combat capabilities. According to the contents of the transmission, the people of the New Decides may be still of some use to them. Additionally, there are rumors that people within their organization have been secretly assisting them. The Admiral looking down at the battlefield map, his eyes fixed on the dossier on his desk on one of their informants, Satomi. Yes, this is THE Twanning, Cassilia Zabi's right-hand man 
from the original Gundam. After Neo Zeon agents managed to free him from a Federation prisoner camp, he escaped to Axis, where he now acts as one of the faction's most important and influential founding members. It's amazing that someone this important is here. This man was in the room when Giran Zabi was killed by Castilia during the Battle of Abawaku. He now bears a black Neo Zeon uniform in commemoration of his time spent within Castilia's inner circle. Over at the Mass Driver, the fighting is still intense. The new decides hold the line as one suit launches into the Lunar Stratosphere one at a time. However, they've run into an issue. The Zeku's Y. It's too big. They're gonna have to send it last. The worst part is that they can't even send them up with their pilots. The G-forces from the Mass Driver are far too dangerous for humans. This only leaves the pilots to assist with loading them, only for them to depart on board the last shuttles as they get out of here. Josh himself is holding the final line of defense with his men he now commands, his troops using ambush tactics and guerrilla warfare to defend the terrain near the Mass Driver Station. Surprisingly, it's been very successful. Over the course of 30 minutes, he's been able to take down 9 mobile suits on his own, not destroying them, but conserving his ammo enough to disable them. It's the only way for his mobile suit to remain effective for as long as possible as he holds this position. He manages to take a 10th one down, a Nero. After jumping out of the cliffs and blasting the suit in the legs, blowing the suit's lower half clean from its top, being forced to change positions immediately after being spotted. The remaining Federation mobile suits shooting wildly in panic as they're slowly getting picked apart as they try to press their lines. As they do, Josh can't help but feel bothered. He wanted his last fight to be something fair, an honorable battle but it seems that this is what he's stuck with now. All the fame and glory tends to go out the window when you're this close to the wire. He feels like a coward for using these tactics to defend this place, but it's the only way. The only way to achieve the greatest amount of results with the least amount of action. He murmurs these thoughts to himself as he downs another mobile suit with another swift sneak attack. As he fights, the signal that Air City has surrendered is finally given. However, his young cadets are too stubborn to give up. They still fight and follow Josh as he's been trying to get them as far away from the fighting as possible. And as this signal is given, Josh sees no other remaining options to stop them. And thus, he forcefully destroys their mobile suits by the legs, permanently disabling their machines and leaving Josh as the sole defender of the mass driver. Keep in mind, he finds no joy in stopping them. But the path these young pilots were beginning to walk was a terrible one, with Josh knowing if they'd stayed, these young men would most likely grow up into some terribly dark people in the future. He takes the blame for it, knowing that he too is also a victim of the same kind of mistakes his forebears have made. This is it. Josh is alone. Brave Cod is gone. The new decides no longer have the allies they wanted to achieve their ambitions with. They're now escaping into the unknown. What's left of them is now uncertain and dangerous. A little while later, we turn over to Mannings. He tells Tex and Sigmund that their job is to take out the mass driver. Their forces are being picked off by ambushes and they can't get close to it. Ryu himself can't help them. He's had to stop at a nearby forward outpost to prepare and rearm. As Ryu hears the orders that Mannings gives them, he can't help but snarl. Why do you keep sending us off to die? We're exhausted. Can't you give us a second to rest? But Manning says no. We can't. He gets bothered by Ryu's tone. What happened, Ryu? You used to be so arrogant. But now, after this, you've become nothing more than a cowardly mouse. You aren't the one who has to decide who sorties. You were chosen and brought here to pilot the excess Gundam. You cannot pass your position over to someone else when you feel like it. Then who's the asshole who chose me? In any case, you can't get out of this, no matter how much you'd like to. Do you even realize that while you were whining about this, even more pilots lost their lives? So whether you like it or not, you need to go. Now! Ryu hates it. He's tired beyond belief. He hates the man's orders. They're trying to work them to death. Even Tex is complaining about it as well, something that Ryu finds very surprising. Regardless, he bites back how he feels about it. Fine, I'll do it. 
the Excess and the other two Zetas form up and make their way towards the launch site. As they draw closer, the three can look down and see them, the countless wrecks of destroyed mobile suits that are scattered all across the lunar surface. They can tell that their opponent is a strong one. They fear for whoever is still fighting down there on the surface. It's unfortunate that not all their suits can fly like theirs. The Neros and Jim 3s from both sides being scattered about, instilling nothing but dread as they fly over. But we have to put an end to this. If we don't, only more will fall victim to this fate. We need to destroy that mass driver. As Ryu slams on the thrust, we turn to Josh. He can see the three Gundams approaching on his sensors. Pah! It's them! He then turns and fires at the Gundam, with Tex managing to spot and warn Ryu just before the shot connects. As he avoids it, Ryu can hear over the comms Sigmund's cursing. Isn't that the one who shot me down last time? We can't stop. We have to push forward, Sigmund. Over with Josh, he's using every bit of power his suit has to leap back towards the mass driver, the three Gundams going past him and making a mad dash for the launch facility, Josh warning them that the three Gundams are inbound. As the Gundam draws in, every new to side suit still on the ground immediately opens fire on the approaching mobile suits. Shoot it down! Don't let it get to the mass driver! But it's too late. The three Gundams skillfully evade all their shots, the three of them opening fire and crippling the central supports of the mass driver's launch rails. The three swinging around and blasting the structure a second time as they come around, the entire mega structure beginning to collapse as Josh makes it there just in time to see the whole thing crash down to the ground, never even being able to catch up to them. As he sees the three pull around, he can see the excess coming back. Finally, I've got you! He tries to fire a spray of energy rounds at him, but it's all in vain. The excess immediately shifts its target, no longer aiming at the mass driver. Within a split second, the excess fires. As the blast of energy connects, the shockwave knocks offshore, completely unconscious. Tex yells at Ryu. Their mission was only to destroy the mass driver, not go after their mobile suits. Why do you always do this? As this argument goes on, the mass driver finally crumbles. The remaining new decides still left on the surface are left with no means of escape. The battle is over. Now, let's take a break, because the fighting in this part is really intense. You'd think, with the new decides now being properly beaten in this final escape attempt, this would be the end of their story. But this isn't where Gundam Sentinel truly concludes. Oh no, we still have three more chapters left. Heck, this chapter isn't even done yet either, but now with the new decides having lost most of their devoted allies, what happens to them now? Well, let's keep reading. Josh is woken up, his eyes opening to the sound of his name being called. It's strange. It feels like a long time has passed. As he awakens, he can hear him. Tosh? Hey, where am I? I, I can't see. Tosh calls to him. Easy, easy. You're within the clinic of a Neo Zeon flagship battlecruiser, the Guare. Neo Zeon? How do we end up here? Turns out, the moment after Josh fell unconscious in this fight with the Excess, the entire city of Ayers, the spaceport, the mass driver, the entire city was attacked by Neo Zeon. It seems that Pinefield's final request was heard, and Neo Zeon, seeing as the new decides had just lost their only means of escape, moved in swiftly to repel the Federation forces and retrieve the last surviving soldiers of the new decides. However, Josh upon hearing this is angered. The way that Tosh is framing it, the Neo Zeon forces didn't exactly make the effort to discern friend from foe, but regardless, they rescued and brought them here to this ship. Every member of their first evacuation team survived, all 40 of them, and it's all thanks to the Zeons. Josh then asks him how it was that he fell unconscious, and Tosh tells him that he's been out for a whole day. They just barely managed to rescue him before the Neo Zeon forces bombarded the entire place. He then pauses for a second. It's a little hard to tell him about what happened after. He goes on to tell Josh about the injuries he sustained. The impact from the beam blast that knocked him out also damaged his optic nerves, and it would be best to avoid opening them for the time being. Josh is startled by this revelation, but Josh tells him that the damage is only temporary, but because of it, 
he won't be able to participate in combat for at least an entire month. This leaves Josh freaked out. A month? Seriously? But Tosh tells him that he needs to rest for the time being. However, this leaves Josh only to stir in his own fears. A month. The new decides might not even last for another month. He fears to admit this truth, as if he were to admit it to himself, he wouldn't be around for much longer, he feels. The chapter ends with a historical report that was written on the same day. On that same day, of March 28th of Universal Century 0088, the Air City Conflict was shipped drastically. Neo Zeon had attacked the Federation forces and made off with all the new Decides forces that were trapped on the lunar surface. All the while, the Federation forces currently engaged at Airs were ordered by the Federation government to cease their attack. All the while, with Neo Zeon bombarding the entire city in that single massive strike, Air City in its entirety was considered lost that day. The city would never be repaired again, and those who resided within it, their lives now lost to the city's destruction. Chapter 11. On board the Neo Zeon flagship, Taj Kray is having an argument with Twanning. Neo Zeon, with its resources and capabilities, are willing to absorb the new decides into their ranks. However, Tosh himself isn't buying it. If Brave Cod were still alive, he would never side with them, let alone have his forces become Zeons themselves. However, Twining himself once again reiterates that they are not like the Zeons of old. They too are a group that are dissatisfied with the current state of the Federation. But for Tosh, he doesn't see things as they do. The Neo Zeon are in direct opposition to the Federation, something they have in common. However, with the new decides being originally allies of the Titans, a task force created for the sole purpose of eliminating Zeon remnant groups, the Titans being people that the new decides originally admired, Tosh worries that the other members of his team would not be so willing to accept the offer that they are being presented by the Zeons. Indeed, they would receive a considerable boost in firepower, but doing so, he feels, would compromise their beliefs and values to see the Federation's integrity restored. Thus, the decision is a very difficult one. Abandon their morals for military power, or retain their faith towards the Earth. It takes Tosh some time, but he finally returns to his men's quarters, and he finally comes to a conclusion. It seems that for this situation, he's had to look at things a little more realistically. Watching as the Xeon fleet makes its way towards the Grange 1, their forces are planning to form up with Aeno's remnant fleet to collect the other forces of the new sides that Aeno managed to pick up. As Tosh looks at one of the ships that's trailing alongside them, he wonders what Brave would do in this situation. But as he contemplates, his thoughts turn over to the Earth. He wonders if his old friend is still down there doing clerical work for the Federation, or has even retired at this point and has possibly started a new life for himself. He wonders if his old friend even knows what he's doing right now. He owes that man a favor. He hopes someday he can return it. However, unbeknownst to him, Tosh is completely unaware that one of the men tasked with pursuing him is the very man he owes this favor to, the man who saved his life in the war. Stole Mannings. Task Force Alpha has recalled all of its forces back to the Pegasus 3. The ship is now positioned out of the moon's gravity, and the Excess and Zeta Pluses have returned to the ship after being forced to abandon their assault. On board the ship, the group is amazed as they can see that Shin Crypt is finally up and around. His Faz may have been destroyed by the Mark V, but Shin himself isn't too bummed out by it. The suit was never configured for lunar combat, so the machine wouldn't have been much help in the invasion of the actual city. Ryu is happy to see him, but is far too tired to stick around and chat. Shin says he understands, letting Ryu go about his business, but not before shouting over to him thanking Ryu for getting revenge for him, Ryu passing a thumbs up as he heads off to rest. And with that scene ending, three days pass over. March 31st, Task Force Alpha has been given a new set of orders. The Federation intercepted intel that the survivors of the new decides had been rescued by the Neo Zeon fleet that destroyed Ayers. Task Force Alpha's new orders are to pursue them. The Pegasus 3 is the only ship capable of catching up to them, so they're gonna have to go in alone. Ryu curses as he hears the orders from Heathrow. 
assholes, another suicide mission? As Ryu grumbles, himself still groggy from his rest, he is actually interrupted by Mannings. You failed your last mission because your tactics were shit. As Ryu looks over and is stunned to see Mannings just a few feet away, as the man waits for his turn for a drink, he still grumbles. Is that all you're good at? Scaring people? He asks him. You still managed to survive in the end, so there's that. Ryu is annoyed by this though. What do you mean, still managed? I survived, and I'm a much better pilot than I was before. But Mannings can still see through this shallow attempt at self-praise that Ryu is attempting to make. You think that because you survived a couple battles, you think you're somehow experienced? Listen, until you're able to beat someone like me, you will always be a rookie. Ryu is bothered by this statement. He tries to brush him aside, however, a question still eludes him. Back on the moon, you said that I was chosen. What was that supposed to mean? Why did you choose me to be the pilot of the Gundam? The excess. It moved on its own. It was strange. Why did it do that? However, these questions also seem to confuse Mannings. The Gundam. It moved on its own? Yes! She started to move by herself. It was thanks to her that I was able to defeat the Mark V. This statement shakes Mannings. The man now deep in thought. I see. Ryu finally asks about the Gundam. Where did this thing come from? With Mannings, knowing some of the information regarding the origins behind the Gundam, yet not privy enough to tell Ryu the truth, tells him that it is quite a fantastic machine, and as for his other questions, he's afraid that those things aren't really things he should be asking his superior. Mannings pivots the subject and asks Ryu how he feels about sparring with him again. He wants to test him and see how well the guy's skills have really improved since the moon. Ryu surprisingly accepts, however on the condition that if he wins, Mannings has to tell him what the whole deal is with the Gundam. Later on the bridge, Heathrow watches as the Nero trainer and the Gundam launch from the catapults, the man being surprised how often these two have been sparring as of late. As the two machines launch though, Mannings initiates a closed laser channel to Heathrow personally. We have something to discuss. It's serious. As Heathrow tunes in, Mannings relays his concerns about the Gundam. You see, during this whole operation, Task Force Alpha has been doing a lot of work to study and test the excess for Dr. Carl. However, with the news that the Gundam has started to act up, Mannings worries that the Gundam's AI might have been compromised. He thinks that possibly Dr. Carl might have lied about it to them. But strangely, the two know a surprising amount of what the Alice system truly is. They know about the incident that led to Ryu's mother's death. The Alice AI was created in her image, and it seems that Manning's fears that the AI has begun to learn some things when it comes to Ryu. The whole reason he's actually doing the sparring match is not entirely to test Ryu's skill, but in reality is hoping to understand what the AI is truly thinking. Heathrow understands and awaits for Manning's report after he returns. Whatever is happening with the AI inside the Gundam, they need to find out what and why before something happens that they wouldn't know how to deal with. We turn to the new decides on board the Guare. Taj Cray has assembled the entirety of all the new decides members who remain. He has presented them with an option either to go with Neo Zeon or leave to continue fighting their own war on the new decides' terms. Many of the officers, despite being of all various ranks and stations, are all in debate over what they should do. Tosh asks one of the officers of the assault teams, a man by the name of Fast Side, what he wants to do. The man says, of course he'll stay with the new decides. However, he's not going to stop anyone who wishes to go with Zeon in the end. With one officer saying that they shouldn't divide themselves, there's only a quarter of them left. What more can they do with such a minuscule number of troops? The men all question if they're really considering this, surrendering to the New World Order. As they all shout amongst themselves, Josh, bandaged over his eyes, brings up the dilemma he and Tosh himself have been facing. They can absolutely make use of Zeon's military power to gain them an advantage, 
However, if they do so, they'll be sacrificing their own code of principles in order to achieve victory over the Federation, the government they wish to reform. But as he makes this point clear, Satomi, who had been amongst the other survivors, just standing in the back of the room, is bothered by how they're treating the situation. You're still choosing to discriminate against the Xeon forces even after they rescued you? We both share a common goal and foe. What's so wrong with choosing to side with those who possess the strength we need? However, Fast Side, still seeing as Tosh is the highest ranking member of their group, says that it's pointless to discuss this matter anymore. If you agree to make the final decision, we'll follow you, Tosh. The group all looks towards him. He finally tells them what they've all been dreading. I understand everyone's desires, and with that, I hereby announce that from this day forward, the new decides will forever be disbanded. I will not stop any of you from joining with the Xeon any more than I will stop any of you from staying with me. If this be our fate, then let us say goodbye without any regrets. The crew gets angered, but eventually they all turn silent. A few of the new Decides officers salute as they choose to leave the mess hall, some of them coming to the decision to stay and others to the decision to leave. Satomi thanking those who leave as they go. Tosh then thanks Satomi for everything he's done. After everything he did to get so many people to join them, he never would have imagined that all of this was orchestrated by a man from Xeon. Satomi is grateful, however he never tried to conceal that fact from him in reality. He's just happy to have lent it his services. However, he himself still has a mission of his own he must complete. The Xeon homeland must be liberated. With Tosh personally thanking the man, knowing that even though they are divided into two different camps, they share a common status as brothers in arms. Tosh hoping that the man does his best to achieve his goal. As the two give each other a handshake, later it's revealed that over two-thirds of the forces that remained decided to stay with Tosh, about 28 men in total. Tosh may have lower expectations for their own destiny, but he is not disheartened by this number. He tells them to listen up. From this point on, the path we will be walking will be a difficult road. So let's take a gamble and see just how much 28 men can truly do on their own. Pause. I really like this scene. Tosh Cray, despite being presented with the opportunity of gaining more strength to continue their fight, knowing that accepting it would break their code, ends up denying it. The new decides, despite being reduced to a mere less than 30 members, are choosing to fight for their beliefs rather than for the desire to win. It just makes me feel sad that this faction has the fate that it does in this book. The new decides throughout the story have been playing a very interesting and unique middle ground, one that the UC timeline has never truly explored, and unfortunately, from how this story ends, we soon learn why it is that such a middle ground doesn't exist between the two sides of Earth and space. In the UC timeline, there's only one of two paths a person can truly take, the one of Earth or the one of space. However, the new decides have shown us that there is a tiny little gray area that exists between them, one that this world unfortunately doesn't have the capability to accept. It's definitely one of the more tragic aspects of Gundam Sentinel, and I think it's one of the best reasons why this story needs this kind of analysis. It's really a very important dilemma to give fans of the UC, as it's so familiar, yet so different from the two core beliefs. Anyways, that was my little note on things, let's carry on. Over with Ryu Roots and the S Gundam, he and Mannings are engaging in a duel. Ryu attempts to sneak up on the Nero trainer, firing his paintball gun as the grunt suit evades his attacks with ease, Ryu cursing as he gives chase. Mannings criticizes his tactics. All of your attacks are ripped straight out of the basic manual. In real combat, you have to be more unexpected with your opponents. The man still calling him a rookie as he questions how on earth it was possible that he managed to survive the whole battle on the moon with this kind of battle approach this entire time. Mannings then turns around and says, sets his IMPC, the data for his Nero being set to mimic the very maneuvers the Mark V had made during the final battle, the young pilot being caught off guard as he spots the approach that reminds him of that previous fight. The Nero disappears from sight. Ryu asks in his head, why? Why must you have me recall the horrors of that fight? Despite Ryu's feelings towards this attack, Ryu clenches his teeth. He's not going to be afraid this time. The Nero dekes below Ryu firing a stream of paintballs that send Ryu to evade 
downwards, firing a stream of rounds that manage to hit Mannings as Ryu manages to get below him. Mannings is impressed, seems he really has improved. The young pilot has bested him two out of three. He reminds him not to forget that real battles aren't this easy. Ryu then reminds Mannings of the promise he'd made. Mannings himself, now knowing that Ryu is in fact the one who is truly in control of this Gundam, despite the worries he had had before. The fight that the two had engaged in was far too different from the one that Ryu had had in the Mark V. He wonders if it was really enough to fully awaken the AI, but from what he was told, the AI hadn't been fully completed when it came into its cognitive development. He wonders that perhaps the reason the AI stepped in in the first place was a simple defensive action in order to protect the pilot. Now, for those who are wondering, Mannings knows a lot more about the Alice system than he lets on. He fears the outcome if Ryu were to find out about the AI's true nature, and he worries that Ryu might reject his purpose within the project. He relates it to somewhat of a love relationship. If Ryu were to find out that Alice's actions are done as a way of developing her cognitive independence and her overall true existence, Ryu might damage all of the progress the AI has made in order to achieve that development. With Mannings knowing that if he tells Ryu the truth, this effort would all be for nothing, he finally, in the end, decides to lie to him. He tells Ryu that he seems to be relying on whatever new type gifts he possesses to win. If he keeps fighting with his heart, his shortcomings are bound to make themselves known. Despite his victory, he still hasn't truly beaten him. Ryu from this notion gets annoyed. He made him a promise and he's not fulfilling his end of it. With Mannings hearing this and brushing him off, the man saying that despite he's won their match, he'd be KIA'd in a real fight. Ryu is incredibly bothered. You old people are always lying, always making excuses. He tells Mannings to watch out next time. If he doesn't, he's gunning for him from behind. With Mannings in the end, stating that it doesn't really pay to be too honest, Ryu, and if you decide to shoot me in the back someday, then you'd best better give me your best shot. The conversation ends with Ryu saying that he will. Maybe not this time, with him making note that there's no ammo left in his gun, but next time, they'll definitely decide who's the better pilot. We then turn over to the Xeon crew on the bridge of the Guare. The fleet has arrived at the rendezvous point at Lagrange 1 as planned, Tosh and his men leaving the ship and departing for the Bull Run, which has arrived to meet him and pick them up. The Bull Run itself is in a terrible state, damaged, battered, and broken. Out of the entire fleet that fought alongside it, now only a single ship remains to its side as an escort. The entire force commanded by Aeno being entirely decimated by the main Federation fleet that assembled at the moon to destroy them. With Tosh and his 28 men departing and saying goodbye, 12 members of the new decides decide to stay behind and actually remain with the Neo Zeon forces, Satomi included. Once on board, Tosh is taken to the bridge of the ship. Out of all the suits that managed to make it through to Aeano, only five remain combat ready. The rest were damaged to the point of near scrap. It seems that the orbital retrieval nets used to slow their exit velocity after being launched by the mass driver damaged the remainder of their suits as soon as they made contact with it. Aeano himself apologizes for everything. If this fleet hadn't have sustained the losses it had, maybe they would have been able to buy the new sides enough time to send their machines up into space a little more safely. He then says that he never really expected that they'd send one of his own children to defeat him. Tosh is confused by this statement, though, knowing that Ayano's own actual son was killed in the fleet battle earlier. However, what Ayano truly means in this context is one of his protégés. The man feels the weight of being outplayed by someone of such high skill, but also of such youth. As the two look out of the bridge window, an officer relays a message. Admiral Twanning wishes to speak with them, with the captain patching them through to the monitor. Twining says that now is unfortunately the time for them to part ways. Neo Zeon still has more preparations to make before they begin their campaign towards the Earth. However, Twining himself is leaving them with a gift, one of the Neo Zeon's Musai cruisers to support their fleet for the time being, as well as something else, a mobile armor. Tosh and the captain can see the Musai approaching from the ship's side, towing a massive cylindrical-shaped object from its rear. Tosh had actually seen it before, mistaking it for an HLV, but he wasn't really sure what it actually was. The thing is massive. 
nearly the size of a small cruiser, the thing spanning nearly 200 meters in length. Twining says that they call her the Zodiac. She's only a prototype, however she's been fully equipped for battle. The Musai possesses all of the data on it, and as he leaves, he hopes that one day the two of their sides can someday reunite. Tosh thanks him, the two sides saluting as they part. As the comms link is severed, one of the officers asks Twanning, Why did you give them that mobile armor? Is it defective in some way? The old man smirking, Of course it's defective, but with them having the capabilities they possess right now, it would stand to reason that they can tolerate having a machine with a few bugs in it. He reminds them that at the end of the day, they are just simply a renegade group of Federation soldiers on the run. It'd be too much effort to give them such unnecessary weapons and aid. The only thing that Twining actually really regrets is the fact that they gave them one of their Musai cruisers to help them tow the bubble armor around. Back with Tosh, he goes over what they have left. 28 men, 5 mobile suits, a crippled battleship with a single escort, an untested mobile armor, and a dilapidated one-year war-era cruiser to tow it around. As he sits in his new crew quarters and uses the ship's terminal, spending a long time looking at the available star maps, finally, as he switches to a view of the Earth and its low orbit, he spots something that catches his eye, the Penta Orbital Relay Station. On a whim, he searches up the data on its current combat strength. Keep in mind that throughout all of this chaos, the Bull Run, despite being commanded by traitors at this point, is still in fact linked to the Federation General Data Network. As he looks at the data, he sees a factor that immediately catches his eye. Every ship that was stationed at Penta was sent to the moon to stop them. The station is completely undefended. He then pulls up the general network, and he looks up the current schedule for all Federation government events down on the planet. He sees a date. The date for the next Federation legislative meeting in Dakar. An idea begins to cook inside his head. This is it. The plan he makes takes an entire day to prepare and draft up the plans for. He finally brings it before the others. The details of this operational plan are roughly as follows. Because the Penta Orbital Relay Station is lightly guarded, a surprise attack can easily subdue it. Once we gain control of a space shuttle capable of descending to Earth, the mobile suits and their pilots will immediately descend onto Car and gain control of the Federation Legislative Assembly currently in session. On the other end, their new mobile armor, the Zodiac, will remain in orbit on combat alert to defend against any Federation forces that may rush in to provide reinforcements to the disabled station. Finally, they will use the mobile armor to carry out a precision strike on Dakar. The mobile armor they've been given is capable of entering the atmosphere. If used correctly, the massive machine could, in effect, be used as a miniature colony drop on the city's headquarters. This is it. The new decides have their final mission in place. The decision to follow Tosh is unanimous. Tosh knows that this battle will definitely end badly, but by doing so, will finally show the Federation and those corrupt politicians within it what the new decides true ideals are. The mobile armor needs two crew members. Tosh, Cray, and Fast Side agree to be the ones to command it. As a finishing touch, the lowly Musai cruiser, the one they were gifted by Twanning, is given a new name, one truly befitting of its purpose. They call it the Brave. And with that announcement, the new decides enter into their final battle. Their target is Penta. Chapter 12 Task Force Alpha the team had been pursuing the new decides and Aeono's forces towards Lagrange 1. However, after observing that their forces had parted ways, their fleet was now approached by the Neo Zeon fleet. With several Gaza type mobile suits firing warning shots at the Pegasus 3 in the process. On board the ship, the crew have been ordered only to engage if the enemy actually decide to attack them. 
due to the current precariousness of the rising conflict between the Federation and Neo Zeon, if they chose to engage them, it would be seen by all as a declaration of war. Thus, for now, the Pegasus 3's crew's only option at the moment is to just try to avoid the Neo Zeon forces for the time being. This job is seen by all of them as extremely difficult mainly because dozens of Gazas are still buzzing around their ship like a swarm of bees. Over in the ship's mess hall, Ryu, Crypt, and Tex tensely eat their lunches as they feel the shockwaves as the Gazas zip by the ship. Can they just stop bothering us? Do you want a battle to break out right now? This is the military, Ryu. You just gotta deal with it, says Tex. Ryu himself, though, is annoyed. All you guys ever talk about is the military. Who's the dumbass who came up with the idea that just because we're here means that we gotta deal with all this shit? Ryu doesn't like this, you see. To Ryu, just like how he was in the beginning, still believes that once he's learned everything he needs to learn from the military, he can just get up and walk away. Despite that, the only thing he actually now feels uncertain about is the fact that he isn't sure if it was good or bad luck that he was chosen to pilot a mobile suit. He was sent out there to kill people, and he asks Tex if he feels the same. He must have spent a lot of time killing when he fought in Karaba. He's gotta be an expert on this kind of stuff. But Tex's reaction is simply a face of frustration, with Crypt interrupting him, seeing as a possible fight might break out between the two of them. Ryu, weren't you always the one to say that you always wanted to go out into battle so that you could test your skills? Yeah, but back then, I didn't know what it would be like to kill somebody. I was naive, I thought war would be something cool back then, something easy. But now, now I don't know. Crypt says to him, though, that he's a killer, just like the rest of them now. Tex and Crypt don't kill people because they like to, they do it because they're forced to. As he sits down and eats his food, Ryu then asks about Sigmund. Where did he go? Tex says that he's actually down in the simulator right now. Ever since he got shot down on the moon, he's been down there non-stop trying to better his flying skills. Ryu says he's touched by the sentiment. He did try his best on the lunar surface. It was too bad that he was shot down when they were so close to winning. Crypt then asks Tex a question. How is it that you're able to withhold your temper for this long? How is it that you're able to never get as angry as you can with Ryu? But Tex says no. What Ryu said was right. Tex doesn't have a right to be angry with Ryu. To Tex, his beliefs on things are his own, just as Ryu's are his. Tex knows that this is the foundation of all things the minority and the majority. However, he also knows that this is the very essence of war, the reason everyone fights. Ideologies viewed in the eyes of those with more power will always never seek to understand the thoughts of those who don't have that power and are beneath them. Hence the lesson that Sentinel teaches us, the reader, why the philosophy of the new decides won't succeed. The Universal Century has two distinct philosophies, the one of Earth and the one of space the two always remaining in such strong contention with one another. Because of this strong hatred these two very opposing ideologies have for one another, there is very little ground for views held in the middle of this conflict to truly be held on their own. This is why the new decides are viewed by both sides as such an alien threat in their respective eyes. The fact that the new decides desire to defend the Earth, but also wish to see space be independent, goes against everything that both of these sides see. It's tragic. I've had a few people ask me before, and I'm going to elaborate it much later in this video. I've been asked a question by many of you viewers. Are the new decides the ideological precursors to B. John Dargle's Manhunters. And I can see why some people would think that. However, it's not entirely true. You see, the Manhunters and their philosophy were born out of human nihilism towards the new type myth of Zeon Daikun. Seeing nothing change for over 200 years, with the Zeon beliefs being constantly ground into the dirt, created a sense of nihilism towards the future that Daikun proposed, and seeded the destructive desire to see humanity destructively return to the Earth. But the new decides are, in fact, essentially what Zeonism is at its core. In fact, judging by the principles alone, 
the nudist sides are probably the closest thing that resembles the original Xeon beliefs created by Daikun at the beginning of the UC timeline. The tragic thing is, is that it's coming from people who were once part of the Federation. That is why the Xeon supported them in their coalition idea, but also despised the fact that they also wanted to see the Earth protected. Remember, Xeon themselves have had their ideology shifted and molded into something else by the Zabbies. So seeing something that is akin to Xeonism, but also supports the authority of the Federation, is seen to them as a threat. If the New Decides have been a larger movement like B. John Dargle's Manhunter Revolt, I think they probably would have won in the end. However, just as Tex says in this scene, the New Decides themselves are a part of that very small minority. Hence the tragedy of such a movement like theirs falling so hard when shown up against the bigger factions known within the UC. Now, I just wanted to talk about the New Decides for a moment. They're a very interesting faction, and that one within the UC we will probably never see the likes of again. And for lasting only a single novel, they make an extremely compelling Force. I will elaborate more on the subject towards the end of the video. Now, let's get back into the recap. Crypt gets confused about what Tex is saying. He really can't understand all these big ideas. He wonders if Ryu feels the same about what Tex is saying. Tex isn't sure though. The guy only ever really seems to act on instinct. Crypt wonders if Ryu really is a new type after all, but Tex says no, he's not really. He's just a free spirit. A person like him just can't stand being bossed around by those of authority. In Tex and in Crip's eyes, they both can agree that they can see Ryu for what he really is, a parentless orphan. We turn back to Tosh. He's sitting inside the Zodiac, watching from its control room as the timer counts down, their ships arriving within view of the Penta Orbital Station. At the station, only three ships remain at the starport, a trio of shuttles, ones that Tosh hopes that they can get to use to get their forces to the ground. The ships and mobile armor approach falsifying their IFF codes in order to fool the control tower into thinking that they're an advanced team from the Federation's main fleet. Come back to Penta in order to maintain its security. As for the five remaining mobile suits, they've been temporarily concealed inside fake asteroids so that the station can't detect them. As they get close enough, their timers reach zero. It's time. The five mobile suits break free. Each of the mobile suits designated to provide temporary guard over one of the station's five extending branches. The three vessels increasing their speed as they race towards the station. As they race in, the mobile armor transforms. Within its frame, two massive Battleship-class Mega Particle Cannons reveal themselves, holding the station's control tower at gunpoint and forcing them to allow the three vessels to board. Once docked, the remaining members of the New Decides, now donning black combat gear, storm the station, with Kray broadcasting from the Zodiac their demands. We, the New Decides, have come to exact justice. We have come to take control of this station. We have a mobile armor and mobile suits positioned outside. If you resist us, we will not hesitate to destroy this entire station. Surrender now, and you will not be harmed. If anyone does not comply, we will not hesitate to kill them. As Cray relays this message, his co-pilot, Fast Side, says that this situation reminds him of the revolt at Pezun. However, Tosh himself can't help but be reminded that he possessed more men in that situation. However, he can't escape the thought that this does in fact remind him of that day. Over the course of two hours, the new decide managed to take full control of the station. The military police officers stationed on the base are the last ones left to resist. However, without the supplies needed to truly hold the station, they soon give up to the new decide's demands. Taj manages to board the station, with the Zodiac and the mobile suits docked in the central port. Cray is amazed as he witnesses his men manage to take control of this place so quickly, despite their numbers. He asks one of his men about the status of the shuttles, the man saying that not a single one of them was damaged. They're going to start loading their supplies first. 
Due to the fact that the station was taken so quickly, the Federation likely has little idea about what's actually going on. We cut to Task Force Alpha, and it's been a few hours since the Neo Zeon forces arrived and began to pester their ship. With the entire crew on the edge of their seats for this entire time, Heathrow finally gives the order, seeing as now is the best time to try and make a break for it, now that their mobile suits have managed to thin out. Get us out of here! Have one of our mobile suit squadrons on combat alert if they attempt to try something. One of his officers worries that making such a drastic move would cause conflict to break out between them. But Heathrow knows the risks. But from what he knows, these Neo Zeons aren't going to risk fighting either. He says he'll take full responsibility if something were to occur. Down in the hangar bay, the ship's alarms blare. The S Gundam has been separated into its three fighter components. It's the only machine fit for combat at the moment, and the three fighters will be essential to the ship's survival going forward. Ryu takes control of the unit's core fighter. Crypt is inside the G Attacker, the unit's top half, with Tex piloting the G Bomber the unit's lower leg section. Luckily, Ryu had test-piloted fighters before doing mobile suits in his career. He knows this little core fighter will handle much better than his old wyvern. As Ryu gives the signal, the three men launch to provide escort to the ship. As they do so, Crypt is bothered. He wishes that at least one of the Neros were capable of helping them, but it's too bad that they're all still being fixed at the moment. They spot them from below and see a squadron of Gaza Seas pursuing the Pegasus 3, with the squadron Leaders spotting the three fighters as they take off, the stubby transformable mobile suits flying into attack formation as they approach the ship. Seeing them line up, ready to take a couple of pot shots at the ship, Ryu signals Tex and Shin, let's intimidate these guys. The three fighters race in towards them, the leader of the Gazasis somewhat seeing their formation for what it's attempting to be, a simple scare tactic. But it looks like they just made themselves targets for a training exercise they could do. As the leader laughs, the three fighters blast in at top speed right through their formation. Do they seriously want to fight? Are they insane? Ryu's fighter lines up in front of their formation, the young man doing a barrel roll as he distracts the Gazas as the two larger fighters take aim from the rear. One of the Gaza pilots panics. He's got a lock on me! Seriously? Has the Federation declared war? He orders his men to scatter. All the Gaza see mobile suits turning around and zipping back to their mother ship out of fear. The three pilots and their fighters laughing as the Xeon pilots run with their tails between their legs. Manning sends them a message, congratulating them. With a boost of the thrusters, the Pegasus 3 launches into the void, finally leaving the Neo Xeon's territory. As the fighters return to the ship, Manning's is brought to the captain's quarters, the captain calling him in to tell him something, something bad. Six hours ago, the new decides stormed Penta. He warily steps to the side, placing a record onto his old record player and lets the track begin to play as it fills the room. A cover of Somewhere Over the Rainbow from The Wizard of Oz. So that's why the Neo Zeon were pestering us. They were trying to distract us. Mannings asks what they could possibly want with the station now that it's been abandoned. Heathrow says that he has an idea, one he's unsure of, but with what Mannings said about Tosh Cray, they do possess a brilliant mind amongst their ranks. If, and if he is still alive, the new decides might have come up with some kind of plan that the Federation has no idea about. So that's it. Neo Zeon tried to hinder our pursuit. With that in mind, it was most likely a means to have the two groups split up. As long as Tosh Cray is alive, they'd never join with the Neo Zeons themselves. And you're confident about that. I know it. From my personal experiences, I know he would never do it. With the two knowing that the Federation will definitely send orders to recapture the station, Heathrow asks about their current status. What do we do in terms of mobile suits? Pulling up his data pad, Manning shows him the Zeta Pluses and the fact that they can be launched along with the Excess. However, the Neros will need much more time. The actual only usable unit at the moment is Manning's own Nero trainer that they've been keeping in reserve. Heathrow himself says that these numbers are completely unusable. Manning's new task will have to be reorganizing what fighting force they still have. However, luckily, Manning's has already been making the arrangements. He's having Ryu remain with the excess core fighter, with Tex and Crypt remaining as his backups. As for the two Zetas, Sigmund Shade will remain as the pilot of one, and the other will be given to Chung Young of the Nero Strike Team, while his own mobile suit is still undergoing repairs. Heathrow then jokingly asks about the last Nero, 
The trainer type, isn't he capable of operating it? But as the two jokingly reminisce, Mannings thinks back, and us the reader are finally presented with one of the biggest mysteries that Sentinel has been waiting to tell us. What happened between Mannings and Tosh to have caused this big of a rift. We are shown this memory, though, in the form of a dream. It's Universal Century 0079, December, the Battle of Abawaku. Three Zakus fire their rifles as they charge towards Tosh, one shot slamming into his GM's leg, severing it and splitting it in half. But Tosh looks down at his suit. Strangely, though, he can't see his GM's leg, nor his mobile suit. Rather, the one that's actually lost his leg is Tosh. He's in pain. He can barely make a sound from the shock of it all. He looks back. He's lost sight of his mothership. He's lost. He blinks. A swarm of Zakus surge around him like a horde of angry demons, mocking him as he floats powerlessly into the void. And as the demons they appear to be, just like death, they draw scythes that slash and tear away at Tosh's body. Once again, helpless and unable to cry out for help. As the darkness nearly takes him, he sees something. Another mobile suit. White, missing a leg just like his own. Stole. As he calls out his name, Tosh finally awakens from this nightmare. Inside his bunk within the mobile armor, his thrashing woke up Side from his bed across the room. Tosh tells Side that it's nothing. He just didn't sleep too well. But Fast asks him if he's really okay. They're going into battle soon. But Tosh brushes him off. What time is it? It's April 4th. It's 5 a.m. He's slept for six hours. The next phase of their mission is about to begin in three more. Tosh then quickly gets out of his bed that's been stretched along the wall. Captain, you're in dire need of rest. We need you for this. Our mission is to escort the landing team. We have everything set. You can relax for the time being. But Tosh refuses. He'd rather spend his remaining time studying the controls of the Zodiac. Side manages to leave with him, the two entering their respective control rooms within the mobile armor one located on top, and one located at the bottom. Their checks are made. The Zodiac mobile armor is equipped with a pseudo Saikamu device, housed in a large compartment within the machine's frame, the space being large enough to hold extra storage, upon which Tosh has managed to stow one of Penta's massive defensive missiles. They don't intend to fire it, as the mobile armor has no method of doing so, However, the added payload of ordnance will ensure the destruction of their intended target, the EFF command office in the Federation capital of Dakar. By destroying this building with the mobile armor's payload, they'll cut off all military support to the capital city, upon which they'll cut off military support to the entire capital building, upon which they intend to occupy. Tosh asks fast how his controls are, with the man offering that they take another test flight. However, Tosh says it's fine. It'd be better to save the fuel. They soon have the Musai begin its linkage procedures, attempting to connect to the ship as it begins to jet away. We turn to Task Force Alpha. The Pegasus has arrived within observational view of the station. Heathrow has ordered the usage of drones and surveillance equipment to monitor the station. The Federation, as of the hour, has requested that they provide reconnaissance on the station, the new decide strength, the station's status, everything. They received the images, two large ships. From the blurry images, the largest one is most likely the Bull Run. It was the only ship unaccounted for from the Battle of Airs. Heathrow asks about the shuttles. There's three from the station that they could see on their feed. Are they intending to send their forces to Earth? They can't seem to send their battleships, as they're too badly damaged. Should they send their mobile suits to deal the final blow to them? Mannings offers that he send the pilots out. Judging by the shuttles, they aren't using them to transport their captives. Most likely, they're being filled with weapons and equipment as they speak. They can attack the shuttles and cut them off. He knows his men are all getting restless. He knows the best chance right now is to attack them. Heathrow gives his men half an hour to prepare. We turn over to the hangar, and the five pilots are ready to launch. The two halves of the S Gundam launching into space along with the core fighter, along with the two Zeta Pluses following behind. Listen carefully. This battle will be the decisive one, so don't screw it up. As soon as the timer hits zero, Ryu shouts to them all, 
Let's go! The five fighters blasting into the void as Task Force Alpha, in its entirety, launches towards their final battle, with Ryu Roots and his core fighter leading the charge. Chapter 13. The Musai spots them. Enemy ship! Three o'clock! Cray is stunned. He didn't expect anyone to show up for a while. He demands they do a scan of the vessel. It's... it's an Argama class. Tosh knows this ship. It's them. The freaks who've been chasing them this whole time. He's not surprised that this ship has been tasked with leading the pursuit of them. However, the officers of the Musai point out that it's only one ship. Tosh wonders if it's a scout team. He orders his men to begin their shuttle launches immediately. As he does so, Fast cuts in. Speaking of freaks, we've got one of our own. Tosh blames the situation on their bad luck. This is what they get for pulling a test flight during a major operation. Fast asks if they should engage, and Tosh gives the order for the Musai to release its tow cables and leave. Within a few seconds, the Zodiac detaches from the Musai and jets off into the approaching battle. Tosh can see them. Launch the shuttles immediately! However, there's an issue. The shuttles need to have a major fuel recalculation before launching and entering the atmosphere. Tosh yells at them as he finds this out. The enemy is not going to wait for you! Go! As Tosh resumes his control of the Zodiac, he orders that the Bull Run and Senku cruisers launch from the starport at once and have the mobile suit maintenance teams on board the shuttles switch to combat alert. As the battle outside begins, we actually turn to the inside of the station. And it seems that through sheer force of willpower, Josh Offshore has managed to remove his bandages and is trying to see what's happening outside. The light is blinding him and his nerves are shot, but he has to see what's happening. He can see the vague silhouettes of Nudicide's crew members running around as they prepare the station for battle with what manpower they still have. As he stumbles through the corridors towards the shuttle bay, Josh feels around the walls for something he could use. I'm not going to be useful. As he grabs hold of a faintly red box, he breaks the glass cover and draws what's inside, a plastic riot control service gun. He stows it in his pocket as he boards the shuttle, not knowing when he'll need it, but also not telling anyone that he's boarding. Over on the Pegasus 3, the bridge crew can detect a massive object flying towards them. Heathrow asks what it is, but the crew are baffled as the scans bring it up. It's huge! nearly the size of a battleship and it's accelerating rapidly. Heathrow already makes the assumption that it's possibly a mobile armor, but the fact that this thing is so massive is utterly absurd. The thing is moving fast. Tosh has already factored in the possibility of the Pegasus trying to evade and begins to bolt towards it at maximum speed. The thing is directly accelerating down the middle of the ship's firing line. As they prepare to engage, the Zodiac finally draws its weapons. The pair of colossal beam cannons are revealed from within its frame. Tosh carefully lines up the sights and pulls the trigger. Two blinding and massive streams of beam plasma towards the Pegasus, the beams slamming into the underbelly of the ship. Heathrow and the entire crew of the ship are thrown from their seats from the massive shockwave. All sections! Damage report! Heathrow floats back to his seat, spotting the massive mobile armor speed past the bridge as it rockets away from them. Heathrow barely able to get a proper visual of the mobile armor as it flies off. As Heathrow puts on his seatbelt, the Pegasus 3's emergency blast shields slide over the windows of the ship's bridge. All hands! Level 1 battle stations! All crew members put on normal suits! As he gives these orders, they switch to the Pegasus 3's internal combat bridge mode. The seats sliding downward, and the ship's bridge spire recoiling into the core of the vessel. As Manning struggles to get to his feet, with his prosthetic straining him from the ship as it shakes violently, he comes to a decision. The Nero Trainer. It's safer in the pilot seat than it is standing in this locker room. Ryu receives the notification. The ship was hit. Crypt curses Heathrow. The guy's a graduated officer of the military academy, and he brought us into another trap? Tex worries that maybe they should go back to the ship, but Chung interrupts them. How can we go back? Continue with the mission! If we take down the station, the enemy will have no choice to give up. Ryu agrees. He's reminded of what Manning said to them. This will be a decisive battle. The team spots the two warships near the station, but the two ships are too far split apart. They can't seriously have to split up their forces. 
Heathrow receives the damage report. The Pegasus 3 starboard engine was completely destroyed by the enemy mobile armor. What? That's insane! That mobile armor has more power than a battleship! But as he sits in awe of the mobile armor's strength, one of the bridge officers cries out, Sir, we've got an unauthorized launch from the catapult deck! Heathrow asks who it could be. One of the Nero pilots? However, none of their units are still flyable. His question is answered when he sees the pilot's face on the monitor. Mannings? Manning says he's heading out. Heathrow is baffled, though. That Nero is just a trainer type! But Mannings interjects. Didn't you say yesterday that I might have to sortie? But that was a joke! But Manning says no. Even though it was a joke, it doesn't change the current facts. His Nero is the only usable mobile suit they can use to defend the ship. He then says to him that it's been an honor. Heathrow tries to stop him, but the catapult launches automatically. Manning's not listening to Heathrow's orders as he heads out into space to hold the line. Over with Tosh and Fast, they're having difficulties controlling the mobile armor. The sheer size of it makes it incredibly hard to steer, the unit trying to bank as hard as it can to try and attack the ship from the rear with another strafing run. Tosh then brings up one other thing they can use to deal the finishing blow to the ship, However, only as long as Fast is willing to attempt it, but he's one step ahead of him. Let's do it! The massive mobile armor accelerating as it blasts off towards the ship for another passing attack run. As they approach, Fast can see the mobile suit on the monitor coming straight for them. Enemy mobile suit inbound! How many? Just one, but the damn thing is flying around insanely fast! It's dancing all over the place! Tosh can see it now. The thing is taking an extremely complicated course to reach them. Over with Mannings, he can see on his monitor the massive mobile armor as it approaches. It's huge, like a spire from a cathedral, but it's surprisingly agile for its massive size. As the thing flies, he can start to see how fast this thing is actually going. It's stupid fast. His eyes catching the glint of the Zodiac's Xeon emblems as it races around. Mannings' eyes widening as he spots it. Xeon! Could Tosh have seriously allied himself with them? He draws his rifle and fires a burst of rapid-fire beam shots. Five beams, striking the massive machine as it jets by. I won't let you near our ship! He spots the damage, and the thing has barely got a scratch on it. It's still heading for the carrier. He increases its thrusters, the Nero flying in pursuit of the mobile armor. Tosh, if it's really you piloting that thing, please stop! But the Zodiac doesn't hear his cries, the mobile armor re-engaging its twin beam cannons. Shit! Manning sees no other options. He blasts at maximum speed towards the front of the mobile armor, flying directly in front of its firing line. Fast curses out. That freaking insect! Should we take it out? But Tosh stays his hand. He's no threat with a suit like that. Don't waste your power on taking him out. The man steering the Zodiac so it can evade the Pegasus's defensive batteries. Over with Ryu, the squadron of fighters approaches the two cruisers. But before Ryu can pull the missile trigger, the Bull Run deploys a signal flare. A surrender flare. Ryu is dumbfounded. They're surrendering? Tex is baffled as well. Are they serious? Ryu doesn't believe it though. What if it's a trap to take them out once they get in close? But Tex makes note that the ships have already aimed their guns upward and have sealed their missile ports. A classic sign of real world warships choosing to surrender. Chung interrupts them. Me and Sigmund will rush the station. The more mobile suits we have at the station, the better. But Ryu is angered by this proposed plan. Bastard, I'm in charge here! Chung, though, doesn't listen. You'll be sorry if you don't follow my advice, Ryu. Sigmund, follow me! As the groups head off to their respective objectives, the station, and the formation of ships, we cut back to the Zodiac. The Pegasus 3 fires a defensive barrage of anti-air fire at the mobile armor. Before the machine can try to sink the ship with its twin cannons, the missiles and beam rounds manage to veer the mobile armor off its course, the two energy beams missing just by a hair. Fast is bothered. Damn it! They missed! He asks Tosh to cut down the recharge time on the cannon, increasing the energy output of the machine. With Tosh giving him the permission to do so, the Zodiac steering away as it commences another attack run. As it turns itself around, the two can see the Nero still giving chase, the tiny little mobile suit speeding its way towards them. Tosh is finally bothered by it. That damn little grunt! 
It's still trying to fight them. He frustratingly orders Fast to go take it out. As the Nero spots the beam charge, Stoll tries to make an emergency evasion, but it comes too late, the Zodiac's beam weaponry absorbing and vaporizing the Nero's right leg. As the light fades, Tosh can see what happened to the Nero. The image of the mobile suit losing its leg sends memories into Tosh's mind. Terrible images, memories, nightmares, the war. Stoll could could it be? Fast tries to get Tosh to fire again, only for him to pull the trigger for him because he can't bring himself to do it. No! No, no, no! Stop! The Zodiac fires again, the images of his friend playing through his mind. The Nero, Mannings, dies. The last emotion he ever feels as the light takes him being disappointment, as he couldn't see the mission through to the end. Heathrow is frozen. Sir, you've lost contact with Mannings' suit. The man remembering the things he said, the captain of the ship remembering the things he said, how important this final battle would be. This leaves Heathrow to question, who's going to be the one that finally stops fighting first? Impossible. Mannings, he's gone. We turn to Ryu and the other members of his fighter team. In order to confirm the surrender of the Bull Run, they had to dock their fighters with the ship's bridge. As Ryu confirms their surrender, he receives the message over his comms. The news breaks him. He slams his body against the wall, sliding to the floor in a heap. The crew of the ship watching as the young man mutters to himself in misery. Bastard, you never wanted to settle things, huh? You really are a horrible person. Now, now I'll never be able to beat you. He looks up, standing above him. Commander Aono. Ryu is furious, on the verge of taking his weapon and raising it to the captives. But before he can pull the trigger, Tex rushes him, pinning him to the floor before he can lash out and kill the bridge crew of the ship. What are you doing? Let me go! I'm gonna kill him! No, Ryu. Stop. Killing him won't make things better. It's over. He surrendered. Then who attacked our ship? He's the Admiral, isn't he? Isn't he the one in charge of all this? But Tex tries to calm him. It wasn't him. It was the new decides. They attacked our ship. What kind of argument is that? He sided with them, didn't he? Aren't all these people supposed to be our enemies? As Ryu lashes and yells out, Tex orders Shin to take care of him. The young man yelling and shouting at Crypt as Tex talks with the Admiral, demanding answers for the Admiral's surrender. It's true. Commander Ayano wishes to surrender, gives him instructions, and the Admiral willingly complies. The gun batteries on board the Bull Run and its last escort cruisers are finally self-destructed, the ships no longer possessing any capability to fight, and you know, finally surrendering and ending the last line of support for the new decides once and for all. The Admiral asks about Ryu though, he takes it a comrade of theirs died in battle. Tech says yes, he was their instructor. The Admiral is saddened. He himself lost a lot of able-bodied men in these last few battles. Among those who fought alongside him, even his own son died when his own cruiser was sunk. He'd probably be a mid-ranking officer by now, Ayeno being the man who had personally instructed him as well, just as Heathrow. Ayeno looks out the window, and I quote, the true objective of this battle was to force the Federation government to change its ways, but in order to achieve that, Sacrifice was inevitable. In today's society, which places so much emphasis on the minority following the majority, those with differing opinions are discriminated against. Eventually, this will only lead to destruction. However, before that destruction arrives, if fresh blood can be exchanged for the attention of the majority, then that sacrifice will be deemed extremely worthy. Mayor Kaiser Pinefield shared these thoughts as well. Tex listens, however, with the man putting a fist to his chin. Tex thinks. The man came from a different background, if you recall. Originally, he fought for Karaba, and his response to Iano is a very good counterpoint to the one he says. That's just your own view. You assumed that the people of this world would never learn to respect each other, so you used violence to correct that. To me and the others of this new generation, that's just insulting. How can you determine who is right or wrong? Yeah, we need those from the old generation to help us grow, but that doesn't mean they should decide our futures. If humanity continues to walk the path set by their predecessors, they'll never make any progress. 
if you were really that determined to carry out your ideals, then instead of surrendering, you'd be doing what you'd said, sacrificing yourself to manifest your own worth. People like you only know how to ask others to sacrifice themselves for you. You are the reason your son is dead. West's speech stuns everyone in the room, even Ryu, and his words leave the Admiral in total shooken silence. But before any more can be said, Chung radios in. They're escaping in the shuttles! Ryu, guys, hurry up! Crypt releases Ryu, who himself has calmed down. Damn it, they really are trying to prolong the inevitable. Come on, let's go! With the heroes boarding their fighters and heading out once again, we turn over to Tosh. The Zodiac is pulling away from the Pegasus and heading back to the station. Fast Side is baffled. Sir, why are we retreating when we have them on the ropes? But as Fast tries to get his attention, he can't. Tosh himself is frozen, lost in his own mind, and mumbling to himself in misery. I... I killed him. Him? Why? Why? Why did you have to come here? As Tosh repeats to himself over and over again these words, Fast's own shouts manage to get him back to his senses. Tosh trying to brush aside the painful images flashing through his mind. He says he's sorry. Judging by the fact that they sent only one mobile suit and the ship's speed has been reduced, the ship seems to have lost the majority of its combat capabilities. Besides, the fact that they only sent one mobile suit to protect them means their entire force is most likely already at the station. We need to head back. We need to defend our troops. We turn to the shuttles. Josh Offshore, like I said, is on board one of the three shuttles. However, he's done something rash. Bad. Really bad. I won't be useless. Without even thinking of what would happen afterwards, seeing as he's of no use to his teammates, and with his injuries being so severe, yet flaunting the notion that he is the best mobile suit pilot within their ranks, Josh has done something very extreme. Taking the gun he found inside the glass case on the wall, he used it to dispatch one of the other mobile suit pilots that was waiting to launch from inside the shuttle. He's now silently waiting inside the cockpit, the cockpit of the Zeku's Y. He thinks about the meeting they're about to seize control of. He doubts this mission will actually succeed. If they take control of the building, unfortunately, those proceedings would probably be held somewhere else. The corrupt officials who are being manipulated by the Ayug will hold their proceedings in another location if the building were to be occupied. However, Josh in this moment can only see what the situation was supposed to achieve, but only for himself, and the fact that he can't allow someone else, like this mobile suit pilot, steal the glory away from him. As Tosh waits, the commander of the shuttle speaks to him over the intercom, the man not knowing that the original pilot has been incapacitated. He says that two mobile suits are closing in on the formation of shuttles. He orders all troops to prepare for the attack. Seriously? They chose to attack now? Josh is baffled. He has no way of fixing this now. There's another mobile suit inside the shuttle bay one facing his own. The other Zeku Ains that they've had have managed to be refitted into Zeku's Ys, and now the pilot of the unit next to Josh responds to the shuttle commander. He asks how much longer till they reach the atmosphere. They're 30 minutes away, but it's too far. Josh knows there is a sitting duck out here. He orders the commander to open the cargo hatch. The commander understands. He warns Josh and the other pilot that he needs to keep track of his timer. The other two shuttles have sent out mobile suits as well. They have to keep track of their timers. They have to return to their shuttles as soon as that timer goes out, or they'll start to get fried up by the atmosphere. Josh confirms, but the other pilot tells him to stay on the shuttle. He'll go out himself, this other pilot not knowing that the man next to him is not who he says he is, with Josh taking the original pilot's place. Josh looks up. The shuttle bay doors opening above, and the view of Earth becomes revealed, the blue reflection hurting his eyes as he looks. He watches as the other Zeku Zwei launches into space to defend them. Sigmund spots the mobile suits appearing on the sensors. They've launched mobile suits to intercept! Chung sees them too. Got it! 
he fires his beam cannons at the lead shuttle, the blast managing to vaporize the ship just as it tries to deploy a Zeku Ainz into battle, the ship exploding before the suit can fully deploy. Chung tells Sigmund to focus on the shuttles. Their suits are the only ones that can enter the atmosphere to pursue them. The Zeku Ainz units can't enter the atmosphere, so don't let up on your attack. Chung starts to pursue, but as the two start to go after them, they hear Ryu shout over the comms. Chung, don't you dare start giving the orders! I'm the one in charge here! Ryu, your machine can't handle the atmosphere. Your fighter can still fight, but you need to obey and escort us. Is this some kind of joke? Ryu shouts to him, but Sigmund shuts him up. They've got incoming! We've got enemies inbound! Chang Zeta opens fire on the two mobile suits that launch from the other shuttles, the two pilots sharply evading and opening fire in return. Ryu asks how it is they're so agile, with Tex and Crypt pointing out that the Zeku's Ys that they're fighting appear to have been equipped with extra rocket thrusters. Chung soon transforms into his mobile suit mode, the formation passing by as the two groups clash. We can't let this become a melee fight! As he transforms into his humanoid mode, one of the Zeku Ainz pilots yells to the other, Gamstina, use the club! The Zeku Ainz next to him, drawing and firing a Sturmfaust at Ryu. He dodges it, but as he looks at the tactical display on his screen, he's confused by the first option the AI gives him so that he can retaliate. Combine? Tex, Shin, are you getting this? They're receiving it too. The Gundam's some parts are all giving them the suggestion to combine in battle. Seriously? At a time like this? Ryu is baffled, but then realizes what the machine might be thinking of. If combining is the best option, then do it. Chung, can you hear me? Chung responds, but he's still fighting those Eku's Y. Chung, buy us some time to combine! He tells him that he owes him for saving his life on the moon earlier. Chung agrees, and actually says to him he won't let them lay a finger on them. Now hurry up and do it! The Zetas fly off, attempting to block the shuttle's path and take on the Zeku's Ys as they enter the atmosphere, the S Gundam's three components lining up and preparing to combine. Back with Tosh, the Zodiac has arrived at the scene, the mobile armor approaching from the rear. Captain Cray, the enemy has attacked the shuttles! Tosh orders fast to open fire. Don't worry about aiming, just divert their attention! The Zodiac opening fire with its cannons and firing into the battlefield. Chung sees the beams and can spot the mobile armor as it speeds in, the man seeing the challenge proposed by the massive mobile armor and its colossal presence, the Zeta going in to try and confront it, with Ryu warning him not to get too close to that massive thing. As the three Gundam components begin their transformation sequence, the Zodiac lines up its sights on the three of them. As its weapons prepare to charge, Chung dives in. I made a promise, didn't I? I'm not letting you guys die! The beam fires and connects. Chung Zeta Plus absorbs every bit of it. The mobile suit shielding the blast intended for the S Gundam, only to be entirely vaporized by the full force of energy that the suit comes into contact with. Chung, he's gone! On the other side of the explosion, as the energy dissipates and the light begins to fade, the Earth comes into view. And facing the mobile armor, with the approaching Earth to its back and its beam smart gun to its waist, the S Gundam emerges, staring with a great look of vengeance at the mobile armor it now faces. That is it! The S Gundam, with all three of its pilots now inside the mobile suit's cockpits, have now combined into the one mobile suit. The massive Gundam opening fire on the Zodiac. The massive mobile armor, despite its sheer size, is still capable of evading their strikes. Ryu curses. That freak is too fast! I can't get a lock! But Crypt tells him to rely on flying the suit. Since the trio are all piloting this thing together now, Crypt will handle firing the weapons, and Tex can monitor the sensor readings. As they all work together, the three pilots operating the mobile suit in unison are not aware that the AI has been fully activated with this transformation. As Ryu orders Sigmund, the last Zeta Plus, to take out the shuttles, the Gundam heads off to confront the mobile armor. As Sigmund agrees and heads off in the shuttle's direction, we turn over to Tosh as he spots the S Gundam as it appears and orders fast that it's time to use their hidden trick. The man agrees, and just as they pull the releases on the mobile armor, the mobile armor splits itself in half. The secret ability of the Zodiac is revealed by this act. 
the mobile armor, nearly the length of a battleship, splits right down the center of its double barrel beam cannon. It separates into two smaller mobile armor units, the Zoans as they're called. They separate and weave around the S Gundam's fire, attempting to attack the Gundam from two different directions. Tex can see the two signals appear on the radar. There's two mobile armors coming in from two and five o'clock! Crypt is baffled by this. Where did the other one come from? But Ryu saw it happen. It split itself in half! The Zoans open fire. Crypt firing back, but his shots managing to miss. Ryu managing to evade the mobile armor strikes. Damn it, Crypt, why are you idling your shots? Ryu asks him why. If we don't take this thing down, how do you think we'll be able to face Chung and Mannings if we fail? Crypt says he'll take better care with the next shot. He asks Tex, in the meantime, to calculate the mobile armor's incline trajectory. They're getting closer to the gravity well, and they need to adjust their flight path to match. But as he does so, Tex comes into a complication. The mobile armor is using the weak pull of the gravity well from the Earth's upper atmosphere to help them turn around faster. It's something that only a vehicle of that sheer size can do, and one the Gundam is unfortunately incapable of. Ryu then realizes it, that they'll have to let the mobile armors come to them. Over in the Zoans, Fast tells Tosh to do it again, attack them with another simultaneous strike, the man raising the power once again on his Mega Particle Cannon. Kray agrees, with his mobile armor charging in fast from the northern pole side of the battlefield. Tex sees them on the sensors. Incoming from the left side! As Ryu jerks the controls to get the suit to evade, his pull comes too late. The beam melts a portion of the S Gundam's waist as it evades. The Gundam is damaged, but not enough to destroy it, yet it causes all of the pilots to freak out. In their cries of fear and terror as the suit gets hit, Alice finally awakens, and begins to take control of the suit once again. The AI, hearing their cries, only to respond with emotions of her own, ones in response to the attack that they're now facing. Revenge. These humans, these people, they're too honest. It's something primitive they have. Conflict consumes them because they are afraid of their enemies. They obey orders because they fear of being rejected by their own comrades. Fear. It provokes them to seek companionship. They become afraid when the enemy appears before them. They've chosen to accept my protection, but only out of fear. They've done it because I am not a humanoid life form, only because I accept what I am given. She then asks herself a very serious series of questions. Questions she's never asked. What are enemies? What is fear? What are these imaginary concepts that these humans are trying to impose upon me, a non-human life form? She questions it all, but on her own, through her own will, she actually understands. If it is through hurting me that it will allow you safety and protection, then hurt me. Though my heart is independent, it does not belong to you. I can accept you, yet also, I can also reject you. I do not belong to anyone. I am myself. No one will choose the path I take, nor will I decide the fate of yours. As Kray takes aim at the S Gundam, he can see Fast charging his own beam cannon. But just before he fires, something happens to his mobile armor. The rear end begins to spark, Fast Side's beam generator overloading from within. The Zodiac's flaw, the one that Twanning spoke about, makes itself apparent. The unit's main reactors were only designed to handle the mobile armor when it was in its combined configuration. They were not tested in their separated modes. The reactor's energy consumption, when split, is not adequate enough to handle the amount of power needed to fire a single barrel of the machine's mega beam cannons. The reactor's energy consumption, when split, is not adequate enough to handle the amount of power required to fire a single barrel of the machine's mega particle cannons on its own. And throughout this entire fight, Fast Side has been continuously raising the power on the output to the cannon, and it seems the machine has finally had enough. The beam cannons have been overheated, and now the unit's engine has been compromised from it. 
fast screams to Tosh. The energy supply! The heat from the mobile armor's main generator actually ignites fast side Zoan's propellant tanks. Before Tosh can properly see what's going on, the S Gundam evades the Zoan as the entire mobile armor is turned into an exploding rocketing fireball that blows across the view screen of Tosh's monitor as it falls towards the earth. Ryu and the others are surprised by the massive explosion, however their own shock of it is nothing compared to what they are experiencing on their own end. The S Gundam, it's flying on its own. The machine turns around by itself and enters an orbiting attack path towards the mobile armor. The two are impressed. Ryu, your piloting skills have improved! That maneuver was awesome! But Ryu says that that wasn't me. This thing, it's, it's moving on its own again. I can't get control of it! The S Gundam beginning to boost itself on its own again as it races towards the other mobile armor. The others are confused. It's moving by itself? What the hell? Ryu doesn't know either. It did seem Mannings knew something about this thing, but he never told him what it was. Tex points out its trajectory. We're heading straight for the other mobile armor! With another boost, the Gundam shoots across the upper atmosphere. A white aura of light dancing off the suit as if it were a comet racing across the night sky. We turn back to the shuttles and Josh is inside of the last mobile suit. The other pilots of the mobile suits on the battlefield are losing it. They got fast! All we've got now is Captain Cray! As the crew panics, Tosh hears all of their shouts and cries and finally yells at them. Open the cargo hatch! The shuttle captain is confused. Who is that? Our altitude is too low, you'll burn up in the atmosphere. No, there's no time to argue. If this keeps up, that Gundam will take us all out. Hurry up and open the doors, I'll hold them off. The captain cuts the view screen to the inside of the Zekuzo-Eyes cockpit. Josh? Why are you there? You're not supposed to be in there. There's no time for discussion. I'm a new decide soldier just like the rest of you. Get me out there! But there wouldn't be any time to bring you back. It doesn't matter! The captain of the shuttle is stunned, but then agrees. Fine, buy us as much time as we have left. As the doors open, Josh heads out into space, the Seku's Y leaving from the shuttle's cargo hatch. Over with Sigmund, he's almost caught up with the last two shuttles. He's baffled. They're sending out suits when they're this close to the Earth? They certainly got guts, but it's freaking useless! He spots the Zeku's Wise launching from the ship, and he looks down at his ammo count. One good shot left. It's up to you, my Zeta! However, there's only two shuttles. He can only aim for one at this range, and at this angle is the only option he has now. He breathes deeply, pulling the trigger, and with that final shot from his beam rifle being fired, the second last shuttle explodes in the distance. And with that last shot, Sigmund's Zeta Plus enters the atmosphere. His end of the battle has finished. He's unfortunately been tagged out for the rest of this fight. Tosh sees the S Gundam charge in. Its shots are getting more and more accurate with each passing round. He evades its shots, but seeing what happened to the other Zoan and how raising the power caused it to explode, Tosh now knows that he can't use the Mega Particle Cannon as well as he can. He sees no other options left to him. It's time. The final option. Tosh activates his Zoan's alternative weapon systems, the mobile armor expanding parts of its armor and revealing a series of multi-clawed subarms, six of which in total, each able to wield a variety of smaller mobile suit weapons within their hands. As he transforms into this final form, he can see from the direction of the last shuttle that another Zeku Zwei is approaching and firing at the S Gundam. Bastard, who is that? Get back to the shuttle! But to Tosh's surprise, it's Josh. He says that this mission is dangerous. He demands to allow him to assist him in battle. But your eyes! You're still healing! But Josh doesn't listen to a word he says. He rushes towards the S Gundam at top speed. Tex can see the suit approaching on the sensors. It's another blue one! He's coming in fast! But Ryu tells him to ignore it. He's still fighting with the Gundam's controls. He knows this wise have a difficulty with close combat, so he says to just keep their distance for the time being. Crypt as well is having a hard time trying to fire the weapons of the S Gundam as well. The S Gundam keeps fighting him with the control sticks. Ryu being baffled as the Gundam isn't listening to a single thing they do. It won't respond to their inputs. The system won't obey. 
The whole thing is locked down. Tex wonders if someone is trying to control their suit from the outside, but Shin says that that's impossible. This thing is not like some kind of RC car. Manovsky particles would prevent something like this from happening in the first place. Then what is it? Unless Ryu finally realizes it. Something about this Gundam is different. It moves on its own. It fights on its own. Not even that, it fights against them. The pilots of it. This thing, it's alive. With the other pilots bickering, Josh fires a barrage at the S Gundam. Incoming! The S Gundam raises its arms by itself, its forearms shielding the cockpit from two micromissiles that try to connect with the torso. But without hesitation, the Gundam continues to pursue the last mobile armor. I thought we were done for. Crypt is stunned. That's saying a bit much, Ryu. We don't know who's controlling this thing. Tex then asks if there's a way to get out of this thing. The Gundam. It's moving too violently for him. But Ryu says it's fine. Fine. If this girl wants to play, then let's give her a show. Shin asks, though. If she's able to move on her own, why does she even need us? But Ryu says that he doesn't care what he wants this thing to do. Maybe this thing has a will of its own, and we're just here to watch her. As the Gundam speeds off, continuing its pursuit, Josh is baffled. He thought this thing would go after him. Instead, it's still flying after the shuttles. Bastard! Face me, Gundam! Josh in this moment feels insulted. When he'd first encountered this Gundam, it spent its entire time trying to take him out at Peizun. Now, it can't be bothered with trying to face him? He uses his boosters and races off in front of it, trying to block its path. Josh yells, firing his rifle at the Gundam before the system can even acquire a lock on it. The Gundam, easily able to dodge the shots that Josh's damaged eyes can barely see the path of. I won't have you look down on me, you rookie! Die, rookie! Die, die! As the Seku's Y fires continuously, Alice can tell that there's something wrong with Josh's unit. Are your systems damaged? Have they malfunctioned? No. Perhaps your body has. I'm sorry. The sad thing is, you have no way to oppose me. So, why are you still insisting on continuing to fight? What are you afraid of? Alice realizes that in this moment, this is the first time she's ever truly been in control of her own emotions. She wonders if, judging by this adversary, she wonders if it's such a frightening thing to truly be alone in this world. But then, she actually comes to an understanding. It's always been frightening, since the very beginning. But it doesn't seem to matter who they are. None of these people seem to be able to escape from their loneliness. If these people continue to reject this reality, they will have no means of continuing on towards the future. Their setbacks will only deny them of it. I cannot create the future, because no matter how hard I try, I can only seem to ever be able to change myself. I'm not human. I have no way of determining what is right or what is wrong. I only know how to use what I have learned, but I also wish that I could talk to sing, and I also wish to leave all of this behind. I also want to create the future me. However, it seems only humans possess that gift. Josh is still chasing Alice and the others. She bats away the Zeku's Y with one hand as she draws the beam saber from the Gundam's knee. She wants to fight at close range again? Ryu can't help but watch as the Gundam fights on its own. Tosh flies with the Zodiac, the machine firing one of its claws with a wire-guided Saikamu bit towards her. Within a split second, Alice turns the Gundam's own eyes to red, the machine spinning around in zero gravity and slicing the Incom weapon as it tries to go in from behind. Tosh is baffled by this. That weapon's useless against you? Well, well, just you wait. I'm gonna get revenge for what you did to Brave on this day. The Zoan subarms draw a beam saber of its own, the two blades locking as the two continue to rocket towards the gravity well. Tosh looks over and can see Josh trying to sneak up from behind. He yells at him, telling him to back off. This is my fight! Then where is my own, Captain? Josh demands it, himself angered by Tosh's orders to him. As Alice swings the mobile armor with a hefty cleave, Tosh manages to block it. Josh, I know this sounds cruel, but this isn't your fight. It hasn't been. 
Please stop! But with these words, Tosh finally gets it, though. He breaks. Josh, I've realized it now. No matter who it is, everyone is afraid of seeing their past faith crumble before them. And when that day comes, they are always bound to drag themselves and everyone unrelated to it on a path that forces those to bear the consequences. Brave and I were like this. Aeno and Pinefield were like this. The new decides. We've lost our souls! We wanted to see change, but instead we dragged all you people down with us. And now, because of that we've lost. We're lashing out now at a world we sought to change, seeking now to destroy it. But Josh, hearing these words, doesn't accept them. Don't you try to tell me that I am a part of that next generation. No, Josh, I'm saying that you shouldn't fight alongside us. You still have the power to fix things. As Josh listens, Tosh manages to nick the Gundam's neck, the main camera on the suit getting disabled. Ryu orders that they switch to the auxiliary, the monitor's quality decreasing as only a few portions of their spherical monitor is able to display the front and sides of the mobile suit. As the screen cuts in, the Zoan swings its blade again. Surrender your life, Gundam! If we're all going to die in this gravity well, then we will drag you along with us! As Tosh fights, he receives a transmission from the final shuttle. Captain, we're out of time! Please hurry! We've already issued our warnings to the Federation! Tosh looks over and can see the shuttle, his own flight path deviating quite a bit from the ship, the shuttle deploying a smaller craft to retrieve Tosh from his mobile armor so that he can return. With an angered grunt, he decides to leave it. Josh, we're going back! As he does so, he does the final adjustments to the Zoan's impact course, the mobile armor still intending to strike its original target at Dakar. As he pulls the ejection lever, the mobile armor's escape capsule separates from the machine's head. What's going on? Why is he trying to escape? Ryu is confused on why the mobile armor's pilot just gave up. But the others don't care. The atmospheric heat is rising. They're beginning to burn up. Tosh arrives inside of the retrieval craft, but as he looks around, he can't see Josh. His unit wasn't following him? The other officers are confused though. Wasn't he supposed to be one of the guys who was supposed to stay on Penta? But one of the officers says that he probably found out they were going to leave him there, since he was wounded. But as they discuss, they can hear Josh over the comms. Captain, I want to fight a battle of my own! If I don't defeat this mobile suit, I will never be able to take control of the future path you desire me to take! Taj calls him a fool though. Your purpose is to surpass people like me! You are the next generation! But Josh cuts the comm link. Tosh demands that they go back. He's going to die fighting that thing! We have to stop him! Captain, it's already too late! But Josh, he's... He's just a child! Over with Josh, the Gundam and the Zeku's Y are still burning in the atmosphere, the two still exchanging fire as the two units burn. Josh screams, drawing the Zeku's Y's beam saber. Tex can still see the other mobile suit on his sensors. Enemy suit! Behind us! Alice switching the suit around, but too slowly. Josh's beam saber connecting and slashing into the Gundam's torso, the blade melting into the suit's armor from the right shoulder to its waist, the machine leaking oil and fluids as the machine begins to burn up. Alice, from the strike, feels the pain. Who did that? It's... it's you. The one that's hurting. Why? Ryu curses out. None of them were hurt, but the bastard hit them hard. Without hesitation, Alice kicks the Zeku's Y in the chest away from her. Why do you belittle me, Gundam? Why do you look down on me? The fact that Gundam is trying to ignore him angers Josh, the man in hysterics, as he thinks about what Tosh said to him before he cut him off. Everything Tosh had said, only making Josh feel more desolate in response. He cries. He swings like a sulking child as he tries to land a hit on the Gundam with every bit of strength he has, only nothing connects, with the Gundam actually grabbing him by the shoulder, almost calmly, comforting. Is the solitude you feel that frightening? Is no one caring about you that frightening? The truth is, is that you are only alone in the way that you are thinking. You have many people in your life who still care about you. If you need others to notice you, you need to take initiative to win their attention not by relying on or imitating others. 
Although you may find doubt in the opinions of them, that too is wrong. You cannot be called a person with a conscience if you do so. You must decide the rules of your own game, and you must be the one who complies with them. Similarly, you must plan your own life. Even if you have finally come to realize this, it's already too late. How can this be possible? How can humans not understand this simple concept? But as she debates this, Alice comes to a realization on her own. And with it, a new emotion becomes clearer to her, and one that she has never felt before. Sorrow. All I can do now is return you to your parents' open arms, to your homeland. And with that sentiment, Alice throws Josh, sending his suit spiraling towards the earth, not knowing if the young man would survive the journey down, but it was safer than being with her. As he falls, Josh can only sob as he thinks about everything he just heard. He calls to his mother, his cries being the first time the man has ever cried aloud since he ever joined the military as a kid. Alice turns around and draws her beam rifle, giving chase with the ass Gundam as it tries to give chase to the last mobile armor and the shuttles trying to descend. Beam shot after beam shot being unleashed and turning the entire machine to scrap as it burns up in the atmosphere. The missile warhead that was stored inside the unit's hold exploding from the intense heat from the atmosphere. As the missile blows, the mobile armor is destroyed. Crypt and the others can feel the pain. He's sorry that he dragged them all into this, but maybe it was worth it, being able to see the Earth one last time before the end of it all. The man in his own heart, though, still trying to find some way to survive this. And as he thinks, Alice speaks to him, saying that now it is the time for us to go our separate ways. Alice then takes control. She has a plan. She goes in to destroy the last shuttle. But knowing that her pilots would perish in the process, she devises another way to save them. Ryu feels a loud, shifting sound from behind, his core fighters separating from the Gundam's two halves. Shin and Tex's own cockpit modules locking to the exposed areas of the core fighter as the S Gundam transforms into a cockpitless series of parts. The core fighter with the extra pods separating and flying away from the machine as it plummets towards the Earth. Tex is surprised. They're saved! With Ryu saying that the Gundam, it saved our lives. It was alive. She was doing this to tell us that she was alive in her own right. Alice says one final thing to them, that she's thankful. Thank you for all the memories. Shin asks about the Zeku's why. He asks if it was really beaten, but Ryu doesn't need to know. He can already guess what happened to it. That is, unless Shin thinks the Gundam is some kind of new type as well, he jokingly asks. The core fighter begins its landing sequence, and as it heads down, the remains of the S Gundam transform back into its two remaining halves into a mobile suit. However, the act of doing so disengages Alice herself, the mobile suit reduced to a mere learning computer, her last words to them being farewell. In these final moments, Alice, whom at this moment hadn't lived as a human, finally dreams a dream of her own. She imagines two spirals of light traveling into the Earth. A voice asks them if they know what the meaning of this is. She does. It is the DNA of mankind, carrying and spreading the memories of humanity. Their S-like shapes remind her of the Gundam, its name, the S Gundam. She now understands what that name truly meant. And with those final thoughts, Alice fades away, her consciousness fizzling out as the S Gundam's internals roast from the inside from the atmospheric heat. I had a dream, she says, a good dream. Alice, in this last moment, finally transcends the barrier. She has indeed become human, but even more so. She has become something greater, and in many ways, a goddess. Not a vengeful one, but indeed a watchful one of the heavens above. Guys, I like this story. I like it a lot, but we aren't done yet. At the point within this recap, we've reached the last two pages of this book, so I hope you enjoy. As they break through the atmosphere, Tosh is lost in thought. To him and everyone, their fates have been somewhat long been decided. He sits in the shuttle with himself and an extremely small group of soldiers. He questions it all. What propelled him to do all of this in the first place? What made him so sure he was doing the right thing? If he had done things differently and had chosen to resolve the conflicts within his own heart, 
before attempting to change the worlds, perhaps that would have been the better approach. The truth that Tosh has now come to realize is that Earth and space do not care about humanity and how it chooses to live or die. Instead, we humans have always brought our own problems into the mix and believe that our problems are to be held as equal to the cosmic order of the universe. Humanity in and of itself is always overestimating the worth of its ideals. With Tosh now realizing, human history has now proven that sacrificing the lives of others to pursue our evolution, the philosophy that the new types and the old types propose, won't provide us with anything in return. Only when every individual resolves their own conflicts will humanity truly evolve. Josh falls to the earth, his mobile suit burning in the sky. He weeps. He remembers his childhood, how he was bullied in school, how he joined fencing to find a way to make himself strong, the crushes he had in school but was too scared to tell them how he felt. He'd imagined himself being like Brave and Taj one day, a decorated officer, an important leader, but now that he thinks back on it all, his love for fencing was just an escape method, just as the new decides are an escape for him now. He dreams of his family. He dreams of his mother who had surrounded him with such warmth and kindness no matter what. He looks down at the earth. It's just like his mother. It's welcoming him into its embrace. But he then looks to the stars, a void that holds little light. But in the end, Josh finally realizes that it's time for him to grow up. Even though the earth feels like a mother to us all, he longs to grow up and separate himself from the overprotection that earth brings. As he looks back, and comes to his own final realizations, he can see Tosh's shuttle. It's over. The shuttle is destroyed, as Josh's mobile suit is destroyed as well in the raging fires of Earth's gravity. Down on Earth, we see a Garuda transport ship belonging to Karaba is flying through the sky. Sigmund Shade's Zeta Plus is being retrieved by it. Sigmund watching as the stream of fireballs flash across the evening sky. Up in space, the Pegasus 3 has docked the ship regaining control of the station and restraining the last remaining new decides vessels. Heathrow asks if they've managed to get a hold of their pilots, with the communications officer saying that the three Eskandom pilots are safe and that Sigmund was retrieved down on the surface. However, unfortunately, the S Gundam was destroyed. Heathrow is surprised. They managed to do it. Those idiots were really able to save everyone. Despite their hatred towards the world, his men and Alice were able to save everyone. As the captain of the ship looks out from the ship's window, he witnesses something beautiful. A solar flare. A massive aurora rips across the earth. Enormous, radiant, and colorful. No one knows who starts to sing, but as the rainbow of color comes into view, the crew of the Pegasus 3 all begin to sing. The same song that Heathrow likes to play on his record player. <laughs> Somewhere over the rainbow from The Wizard of Oz. As the sun rises on a new day, Ryu is greeted by the blue skies of Earth. He asks his friends if they're alright, and the two say yes. Yes, they are. Tex asks if Ryu is able to land the fighter, and it seems the fighter is actually fully intact. However, their course was severely thrown off upon re entry. They're flying above the Arctic Ocean, and the closest base is miles from here on the Russian coast. However, just as they worry about their landing situation, the Garuda finally appears as well. They're here to come pick them up. On board the ship, the commander of the plane receives the ID code from the core fighter, the man ordering his men to prepare the hangar for his arrival. As the fighter makes its approach, Tex asks about Sigmund. Did he make it? Only for Ryu to jokingly tell him that he's fine. They already can see the Zeta parked inside the hangar ahead. The fighter lands, and the pilots are greeted by Sigmund, who sees them come in and waves as they touch down. As they all reunite and cheer that the mission is over, Task Force Alpha's mission is concluded. The heroes of our story, including Alice, growing in many ways from where they once were, bringing the story of Gundam Sentinel finally to an end. Wow. Just wow. It took me six months to finish this project, and I gotta say, Sentinel is worth it. Just like I said in my past videos, this book doesn't really make a good show idea. However, it absolutely has good movie vibes. This story has such a good arc for every character, and it's just perfect. It didn't do much with the new type stuff, which some Gundam fans may not like, 
but this story definitely does well without it. It implies a lot of stuff if you want to read into it, but it doesn't actively seek to use it, which I think is interesting. Seeing our heroes have all their arcs come full circle is really impressive. Ryu becoming a leader from when he was a cocky and arrogant pilot who ignored the orders of everyone around him. Crypt going from this worrying spray and pray type character to a clear minded sharpshooter is definitely a nice thing to see. Tex goes from frustrated and apathetic colleague to caring and understanding friend. Manning's from angry and bitter officer to faithful and respectful teacher. The list goes on. Everyone has an arc in this book. Chung goes from being the guy who can't stand it when idiots like Ryu don't take their job seriously to being the one who's willing to lay his life on the line to save them. Sigmund, who we only see get shot down and is a background character throughout all these fights, hilariously is the one guy who makes it back with a functioning mobile suit. Commander Iano, who despite being an influential and powerful leader, is reduced to a single warship by the very military he served, all because he didn't know the full extent of the plans of everyone else around him. Heathrow grows from skeptic to someone who understands and acknowledges his peers. It's just awesome to see this. Let's talk about our antagonists. Brave Cod, the man who led the new decides but despite everything didn't want to be in charge and just wanted a good final battle. Josh Offshore who spent the beginning of the story with such confidence in himself and his skills is shown time and time again that he isn't as good as he thinks he is, that all that he wants is to be seen as someone big, only for the man to die alone, not fulfilling his leader's last request. Tosh Cray, who starts off the story as such a big, manipulative presence in the story, but once everyone else catches up to his plans and is starting to overcome them, grows more and more and more desperate, no longer seeking to make a difference, but instead dying to try and prove a point, one that no one will ever understand. And lastly, the most impactful character in this entire tale, Alice. This character took the longest time to fully grasp, but her whole story and her arc is the defining element of Sentinel. Think about that. An artificial intelligence created for the purpose of destroying life on humanity's behalf forms more of a human connection with us the reader than the human characters themselves. She evolves into something so much more than we are in the end, and it's just beautiful. Alice, despite her mechanical and physical limitations, became more of a new type, and I mean that in the figurative sense, than any of her other cast members could ever possibly become. That's really cool, and an awesome metaphor for Gundam and its new type philosophy to have when put beside it. Now, let's get into some notes I've got, some questions you guys have been asking, and some things I've personally noticed. Firstly, and it's something that many fans don't realize unless they read the book, Amuro Ray does not show up in this story. Fans for years have been saying for years, Oh, Amuro Ray shows up at the end of Gun of Sentinel to help the heroes. No, no he doesn't. The Zeta A1 test image colors is a mechanical design only, and it's only implied that the Garda class that appears at the end of the book is the Garda used by Hayato Kobayashi. Meaning that despite what all the fans say, and I'm solely going by the novel version, Amuro Ray does not appear in the story. Note number two. Gundam Sentinel has a lot of mech designs, but a lot of them don't actually appear in the story. Suits like the Refined Barzam, Deep Striker, and the Zeku Dry don't actually show up in the story. They exist solely just to expand upon the mobile suit roster that exists in the novels, showing us a deeper look into the physical lore behind the mobile suits themselves. Number three, when it comes to Gundam Sentinel, everyone who knows of the story immediately believes that it's just about the new decides uprising at Peizun, when the real truth is that the majority of the story is actually what happens after those events. They say don't judge a book by its cover, but it seems the majority of the fandom has largely judged it so. I'm not going to go into details as to why, but it's been the consensus for fans for many years, when really it seems like the fandom isn't actually aware of what this story is trying to do or what the author is trying to achieve. 
Now, I've gotten this question before, and it relates to something that me and this channel are very passionate about. And it's a question I've had a couple of you guys ask me over on Discord. Are the new decides, and more importantly, by extension, the people of Ayers, the precursors to B. John Dargle's Manhunters from Gaia Gear? And what I've got to say is, no, neither of them are. Spiritually, the people of Ayers do share the same desire as B. John Dargle, the desire to return to the Earth. However, this is actually not entirely the same desire. These two groups look very similar on the surface, but are fundamentally different in their approaches and their origins. The people of Ayers believe that Earth can someday get better, and that one day, humanity could one day return to the planet, something that the Manhunters also share. However, they also believe strongly in the Federation's ability to govern humanity. When shown by the new decides that the Earth's becoming corrupted in their eyes by the Ayuk's greed, they choose to oppose the government that the Ayuk has installed. They believe in the coalition of lunar cities, but are completely blind to what it means for their original, fundamental desire they possess. If the moon and its cities were to secede from Earth's rule and create a government of their own, Earth would never accept them back one day. Zeon would accept them, but the people of Air City hate Zeon. This idea is actually in direct contention with Bijan Dargle's own philosophy, whom of which desires humanity to return to the Earth but solely for evolution's sake. Dargle's philosophy is the eventual result of the new type philosophy in its current state, left to stew for over a hundred years. Nihilism and hatred for what was Zeonism, forming into a belief that is the direct antithesis to Zeonism itself. They don't trust space noids. They don't trust the Earth Federation. They actively betray the ones who believe in them, and they aren't seeking a collaborative coalition like Ayers is. B. John Dargle believes himself to be the rightful ruler of humanity, because humanity, in him and his own people's eyes, have lost their way and there is little hope for us, and Dargle believes he is the one to correct that. Now, let's get into something else, something different, and that is something I wanted to mention about Sentinel that if you do the proper research, you'll actually find out. And that is that there were early plans, a long time ago, for a sequel. One that wasn't written, nor produced, but one that has managed to capture a lot of interest within the Gundam fandom whenever this topic is brought up. What you see here is concept art from this proposed sequel, showing us a brand new version of the S Gundam. We don't know when this story would have taken place, or which characters would return, but many people and analysts like me have made note that the most likely scenario for a sequel's plot would have to go deeper into the origins of Alice and the background story of Ryu. Remember, we didn't find out all the reasons his mother created Alice the way that she did to begin with, and it is my belief that if they did make a sequel, it would have taken this route. Now, why was it not made? Well, various legal reasons aside, but the most likely one is that the author most likely didn't want a sequel to potentially damage the original message of his first book. I mean, think about how good of a story this is. And then think about if they made a sequel to it, it might ruin the original intentions and the original ideas that the first book had proposed. Those are just my thoughts on it. I'm no expert when it comes to Masaya Takahashi, however, that's the kind of vibe I get whenever I see this concept art and read on this cancelled project. And lastly, and it's something that I think most fans will not probably think about, is the fact that many Gundam fans want a series on Sentinel, but also many of them haven't really actually read the book. Cause I've noticed that there's a bit of a correlation between some of the people who have read the book and the people who just love the mech designs. And there is nothing wrong with, with that view on Sentinel. It's perfectly fine. But what I highly recommend is actually reading the book. Because the day that Sunrise announces and releases an animated Sentinel project, it is going to be analyzed by the readers of the original book intensely. Say they added some new characters, or mech designs, or other elements and gave them vital or decisive roles within the animated plot. Those elements would be heavily debated and scrutinized by the fandom for that potential project's entire existence. So Sunrise, listen up. 
if you ever decide to do Sentinel as an animated project, make it as accurate as possible. Anyways, that'll be it for this final video on Gun of Sentinel. It's been a long road to get here, six months to be exact, but I'm so glad that this story is finally finished and I'm so glad that you guys got to experience it the way I did. I'm actually gonna give a little bit of a shout out to Zeon Scanlations over on Twitter, who was actually responsible for originally translating the Gun of Sentinel novel. I actually highly recommend his content. It's fantastic. All the work that people like him do for the community is incredibly important for us fans. And I highly recommend you read Gunham Sentinel. Xeon Scanlations over on Twitter even just released a brand new version of his translation of the book. So I highly recommend you go check out Gunham Sentinel. It's a fantastic read and it provides some answers to some questions that many Gunham fans have never even had before. It's such a fantastic and such a powerful piece of media and it deserves more readers. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Share this video with your friends. Check out our discussion group over on Discord. We've got some wonderful people, not just me. We're all super passionate about all of Gundam, and we'd love to have more people share their thoughts and ideas and opinions on stuff. Remember to turn on the notification bell to make sure you're caught up with my videos, and stay tuned for my next upload in the coming weeks when I start our journey into the mysteries of Shirako with Gundam Valpurgis. That'll be it for this video. This is Gaia Gaius, signing off. Farewell.